Hey, what's up? I'm Mike Squires, and this is the Couch Risk Podcast, episode 89. 89. I'm really getting up there. That's crazy to me. Um, listen, the, my guest on this episode is a Seattle legend who is named Kurt Block of the also legendary Fastbacks rock and roll outfit. Uh, through conversation, we we sorted out. Probably formed in 1979. First show, 1980. Um, Kurt is a formidable musician. Uh, records, produces bands. Did the fastbacks for over 22 22 years. Um, produced a Grammy nominated album. Uh, he's jumped up and jammed with Loaded a couple times. I'm trying to think if I've jammed with him other times. A fearless player with a ferocious style. Um, you just, you don't know, you don't meet many people who are equally as into punk rock as they are into Yes and Michael Schenker. And Kurt is into all of that. So you he tells how he he saw Judas Priest and Van Halen two different concerts in one night in 1979. That's pretty hot. Um, and uh, what a fun conversation. I feel like I just barely scratched the surface. Kurt has uh, a lot of stories, and it's always a f- super fun time to hang out with him. Plus, I wrangled him for a Coutress video episode, which I'm really excited about. He's going to fucking destroy it. Ah, uh, Kurt also works for the Gibson Guitar Company. As um, I don't even know what his official. You know, he does like uh, tech, guitar tech work, on uh, all their stuff at the artist lounge place in Seattle. What is it called? The artist lounge. What is it called? The showroom. Jesus. You know what? I'm not gonna edit that out because it's not my style. Anyway, we love Kurt. We love the fastbacks. Uh, what a good time. I hope that you enjoy listening to us ramble and go on and on and on. Hey, you know you could support the Couch Risk with uh, a monthly pledge of 99 cents, right? Go over there to anchor.fm slash couch dash riffs or go to anchor.fm and just search for Couch Riffs. And boom, there you are. 99 cents a month. That's easy. And... You know, I'm churning out two episodes a week. Woo! That's a bargain. Anyway, I appreciate you listening, whether you pledge support or not. Um, But I will thank folks at this very moment who do support Couch Riffs, all right? So... (laughs) Uh, So listen up. Thank you uh, to Ryan Waters. Thank you, Hayden Smith. Thank you, Jamie McParland. Thank you, Teresa Morgan. Thank you, Matt Gabs. Thank you, Justin Jones. Thank you, Deja Colantuono. Thank you, Adam Pranica. Thank you, Joan McKagan Baker. Thank you, Dan Hurst. Thank you, Dan Leary. Thank you, Kathy Giardano. Thank you, Michael Lacerda. Thank you, Rebecca Pellman. Thank you, Chris Smith. Thank you, Perry Morgan. Thank you, Oliver Spencer. Thank you, uh, Paul Hutzler. Thank you, Justice Gash. Thank you to Rolla Amplifiers. Um, still really want to have Bob Balcher on the show. I And I've never reached out to him. I'm just waiting. I'm just hoping that um, maybe it'll just happen. You know? It's not going to just happen that way. That's not how things happen. But listen, also, thank you very much to River City Guitars. The small but mighty guitar shop that could out there in Spokane, Washington... Go check out rivercityguitars.com. They have a really killer selection of guitars. Now, the website does not reflect everything because my guy Bobby has been so busy buying stuff. Now, here's the thing. Uh, If you have some guitars or a guitar that you want to get rid of, 
maybe you're looking around and you're like, you know what? This summer, it's this is the summer that we add that deck on the house that I've been wanting to do. And, you know, that old telly, I don't need that thing anymore. Let's call Bobby Kless over there at River City Guitars. And um, you know what? Bobby will buy it. He'll buy your collection. He's looking. Hot diggity dang. Um, he's also selling. He's selling stuff. But you know what? Every week I have a pick of the week. Um, and this week it's something... It's the most, it's the cheapest and most practical selection that I've made. Because I know you've been buying a lot of stuff. I know you've been buying a lot of stuff since all this has been going on. So guess what this is? This is the Signal Flex, <laughs> Signal Flex uh, power supply for the pedal board that you've been talking about building and just haven't done. Now, this is a used one. It doesn't have the, you know, all the um, crazy fucking 2.1 gigawatts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's also $39. So it's an easy in. You, you want to you wanna do this pedal build project, just buy this, this uh, pedal power and you're done. Or maybe you need to build one for the fly gigs you're not doing. You need a small one for your sideband or for your just for practicing. Thirty nine bucks, you know. Go do it, man. You can't afford to not buy this thing. You know what I'm saying? You just can't. Now, uh, you want to get a hold of these guys? Listen, five zero nine eight one eight seven six nine three or sales dot rivercityguitars at gmail dot com. Give them a call. They also have, go follow them on social media because they have a ton of stuff that they post on social that hasn't made the website yet, okay? And uh, that's where you're going to see a lot of stuff coming in. Maybe you can get it before Reverb sees it. That's all I'm saying. Um, We love River City Guitars and they love you. Now listen, I've been going on for too long and it's Kurt's turn to talk, all right? So I'm going to pass the candle, the talking candle. What do you get when it, when it, oh, who, you can only talk if you're holding the ball. Kurt gets the ball now. Uh, don't forget the golden rule. Wear a mask. Uh, don't be an asshole. And we love you. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you, I, uh, you, can I hear you? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, that's wonderful. That's incredible. Let me turn it up a little bit. I don't, yeah, I think it could be, could be cranked a little bit. Can you hear me? It's always best when it's cranked. Rock and roll. Hey, it's a rock and roll conversation. Best when it's cranked. Can you, can you hear me okay? Because I got the phone, it's on a, uh, it's on a little stand here so that it can be right by the microphone of which I'm recording on. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, I think we're good. I think this is good. I think this oh, is a, it, I think what we're doing is a good thing. We're doing well, we're doing a good thing for us and we're doing a good thing for everyone else too. Oh well, I mean there there may be some objections, but you know what I say. <laughs> yeah, screw the non-believers. I say you know what I say? All kinds of shit. <laughs> hey, hey man, you know what you do know and I say? All kinds of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you know what I always say? Something appropriate. <laughs> you know what I always say? Often the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can think about it. We you can, can go on, on like on this for, for a couple little. hours and that'd be great with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then just cut out all the uh cut out all the thinking parts, all the dead air or the Nope. And the and then uh just yeah, that'd be good. Nope. Good cons- <laughs> consolidated crap. Uh, how, were you really traveling yesterday? I was traveling. I was. Uh, I, I came back from uh, from California. I helped a uh, helped a friend move down to to California. What a crazy and, time to move! Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes you don't get a choice on when it's time to <laughs> <Yeah>. move. <laughs> True. And sometimes, that. sometimes it's time to move, and uh, you got to move. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, you know. 
what the climate is, you you know, you got to go, you got to, you got to do it. And, um, you know, so I'm not one to, you know, overthink things when it's, when, when somebody's in need of an assist and you can do it, then yeah, yeah of course, yeah. bring it on. Uh, I, I help you. Yeah. We've uh, most certainly seen some climate change this year. <laughs> yeah. Not in the climate ways change. we've all been worried about. Right, right. Well, in ways in ways we have been worried about, in ways that we have not yet considered. Right. Climate change under the under the broad climate change umbrella. There's still climate change deniers, and I'm not talking about the weather. <laughs> hey, man, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about the weather. Hey, man, I'm not talking about the government. <laughs> the government lies. Uh. What's up? Uh, pretty much everything that's always, you know, like pretty much everything other than the broad umbrella of live rock and roll. You know, a lot of uh, everything's the, uh, other than that umbrella, which has been folded up and put in the uh, in the uh, umbrella stand near the door. Right. That's the broad umbrella of live rock and roll for, you know, it, it, it's a big umbrella. It includes, you know, uh, uh, watching live rock and roll and, and playing live music and, and for the most part, recording live music. Although um, I did, I did have a, a, a rock and roll recording session uh, last weekend. Yeah. It was maybe the. With the first, uh, the first of its ilk since the uh, the turn of the the turn of the cards. Well, tell me something um, good. Yeah, yeah, and it, it was great, and it was wonderful, and um, and uh, and two of the people in the band were uh, are 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 married, and the other one lives not far away, and um, they're married to each other. Just- What's that? Yeah, they're married. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in, in fact, married to each other, and the other one, uh, they they were they were distant, and um, we did. I think we did good. Yeah, I think we managed to uh, make rock and roll, and stay safe. It's such a, uh, it's so goes against rock and roll, right? I mean, right, being right. safe the- is like, <laughs> well, you know, like let's face it, everything goes against rock and roll. Especially after the whole 35. Idea, be, uh, the whole idea of being safe, of course, is 100% against rock and roll. And the whole idea of, of distancing is what, you know, is what the, the, the barriers when uh, when the, the punk rockers uh, carried their, their original flags in, uh, in 1977. It's like, you know, break down the barriers between the band and the audience. You know, you are us. Right. And... That 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 also flies in the face of any sort of social distancing. It's 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 just not uh, it's just not how rock and roll. You know, you're supposed to you're supposed to be packed in there, and you're supposed to be making noise and, and everything that uh, everything that you're not supposed to do. So you know that's that's tough. Hey, Let's listen, face it. It's it. I it's, had a great it's, idea. It, I just okay. I just guessed it on someone else's podcast and. Uh, and I talked about it on their podcast because I came up with it during the conversation. But this one's going to be posted at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning. So I'm going to beat them to the punch and I'm going to premiere it here. Even though yeah, even though people will probably be hearing it after. I had an idea for venues. Just like the grocery store where there's your, the, the, the floor would be taped off. Like, all right, here's your little cube. Here's your cube. Only, Here's where you wait. Yeah, 40 people can be in this venue. But up in the front, you put a merry-go-round. And then in every third or fourth uh, little wrangle, you know, where mm-hmm. you hold on, that's where yeah, that's yeah. where the slam dancers go. And uh, you just around and around in a circle, but safely at a distance from one another. Right, right. So it's 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 hardcore. It's 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 punk rock, uh, uh, slam dancing, but on a merry-go-round, and and everybody gets their 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 uh, their full view of the stage from right up front, but only once a revolution. That's right. Yeah, I like that idea. Pretty good, right? I'm an idea man. Yeah, oh, it's very good. 
I guess we could start with the core zone. We could see if we can install, you know, could you have like maybe for a, for a, a, a fair size venue, you could get two or three merry-go-rounds. Right. Really go stage. wild with the pit would be crazy there. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, you see the pit at core separate... zone? Three merry-go-rounds. It was fucking wild, yeah, yeah. man. Now featuring three slam dance merry-go-rounds for your, uh, for your enjoyment. Yeah. Three mushy go rounds <laughs> Ma- mashi go round yeah. yeah yeah how many people could fit on each of them you could probably you three know. or four i think yeah, yeah yeah easily three or four well not safely distanced you know these aren't giant because you're talking about the floor of a vape they still have to sell tickets and and real sure, estate sure, is still I, limited well, I, 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 I when i was sitting on the couch not that long ago i started uh seeing how much of uh the uh of math high school math i could remember <laughs> and uh, plotting how big a round table would have to be in order to fit four people six feet apart and i thought well what if you only had three people you know how big would the table how big would the, the you know the the diameter of the table have to be you know to fit these people on there well and, the and, circumference uh, would have know. to be 18 right well no no because the uh you know the six feet is person to person not it you, that's not counting the uh the arc right Oh you yeah, know, it would the, have the, to be the, bigger. The, it would be. See, it would be a little a, bit bigger. This is a geometry, or is it algebra? Right, right. And and you know, I took I geometry. I took advanced math. I took you know, uh, uh, introduction to calculus. So I thought I could figure these things out. And you start writing that stuff down and and making your little triangles and your things like that and trying to cut up your cut up your thing and get your radiuses and stuff. And it was a little harder than I thought. But the piece of paper is still upstairs. It's not downstairs where I would let you know what my findings were. Oh, here's but, uh, what you could was, do. You, know, you could just go on Amazon and buy a calculator and figure it out. Well, yeah, but the cal- first you have to figure out what the, the, the math is not the problem. It's the uh, figuring out the, you know, how the how the geometry works, really. Right. Um, and then figure out what your what your radius is. And then you can figure out the diameter. But you don't really care about the diameter of the table. That's not important because that's not how you buy a table. It's by right. Your, I mean, uh, IKEA your... doesn't even sell tables that big. Well, it, it, <laughs> it was. It seems like it. It seems like it was like an eight foot diameter table, which you know is not insane, but still pretty big. Not and that, it was. Too it was big for most bigger. apartments, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, then I thought, oh, what if, what if we, what if we took it down to. Uh, down to a three-person table, and then I, then you know what? Then I I lost interest because I knew I wasn't going to do that or anything. So I just made a cup of coffee and played guitar, not plugged in for a while, <laughs> as we are wont to do. <laughs> I got bored, made a cup of coffee, played electric guitar, not plugged in. Wait a minute, are you trying to tell me that you had the option to play electric guitar and you got easily bored with doing maths? Yes. Yeah, yeah because Crazy you, talk. you you can play guitar almost all the time but but every now and then <clears throat> your mind wanders and you come up with trying to solve the world's problems. And I'm sure you're the same. You 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 know the 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 ills of society and you think maybe maybe I can do more than just complain about it and uh and play loud electric guitar. Maybe there's more we can do. And Imagine that. you know then I had this dream that we had tables that everyone sat six feet apart and you could sit there. You could, if you had long arms, you could play cards, maybe play poker. You could, you could do it. You know, you could do whatever you wanted. How big would that table have to be? And uh, then I woke up and I thought, wait, I, I, I took years of, 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 uh, of math in school and I'm interested in math. I'm fascinated by it and, and like solving problems. Maybe I could put all this stuff together. So I sat there. I had a little piece of scratch paper and a scritchy pencil and, uh, you know, drew the table and put in a little, some X's and Y's and some uh, diameters and some pies and some pi D and some two pi R and some I love pi. A squared plus B squared, the square root thereof. And came up with a number and uh, seven. then seven. made the coffee and played some electric guitar, not plugged in. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, you're doing a good thing. 
<laughs> hey, at least I tried. Yeah. Uh, it's better than going uh, <laughs> taking taking your your woes and your frustrations and amplifying your voice through the funnel that is Facebook. Right, right, right. And and I mean, I I I I do enjoy I do enjoy other people's rants and raves, whether they're what I believe or not, or even even what even if it's what they believe or not, because a lot of people will uh, lash out against something and and say something loud, right, and then take it back later. So, oh, I don't know what I was thinking. It's like, well, well wait. So you went on and told all the people that you, all your friends, and you know a lot of people have lots of friends on Facebook that they don't know. Yeah. Um, maybe not everybody, but 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 Many. a lot of us do. And you said something in all bold letters that you're not <laughs> even sure if you believed in. Well, you know, you know what that is? That's entertainment. Yeah. You know what that is? Foolish. <laughs> well, some would call it foolish. Some would call it entertainment. Uh, um, uh, and you know, I like to see a, you know. Sometimes foolish equals entertainment. <laughs> here, here. Yeah, here, here. I guess we're trying to, we're trying to walk, we're trying to not prove that right now. We're trying to prove that entertainment is, is vast knowledge, self-assuredness, and universal truths. And yeah, in, in a rambling format. In, <laughs> in, a, a, hey, in a slightly. In a ramble, slightly, tamble, 50-something package. Yeah, yeah, ramble tamble. Now there's there, there's a good uh, there's a good number, a little credence Clearwater. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you are you still doing Gibson work? Yes the um, the Gibson showroom in Seattle um, was in the process of moving when the uh, when the bottom dropped out of all of this and. Uh, and we had uh, uh, we were we were getting very close to opening our new showroom space, which is not uh, not terribly far from where, where the original Gibson showroom was. Um, our, our new location is, is in, uh, in our new location is in Sodo. Oh yeah. Um, and when when all this happened, and so it uh, just got put on hold, basically. Um. And so there's a uh, there's a Gibson showroom on uh, down down there on the on the floor of a building, a, a mystery location not yet divulged mm-hmm. that is about uh, you know seventy five percent set up and um, as soon as <clears throat> as soon as the Gibson company is ready to say okay you know it's time to uh, release the crack go back to go back to work with your masks on or you know whatever whatever their official word is yeah then that then that can happen but uh right now it's just um sort of sort of is slightly in limbo we're you know we're getting some things done well we're, we're selling some guitars we're you know we're uh getting stuff set up we're but um you know it's it's all it's all just it's it's all just sort of you know slowly and and uh and miscellaneously getting together. It seems like a lot of good stuff has happened uh, in the last couple of years for the guitar lineup. For the Gibson Company, oh yeah. my yes! It, it, uh, the uh, I I am absolutely a fan of the new instruments that are that are coming out of that company. Um, to the point of you know just like. God, do I? I really, gosh, I should, I should get one of these new SGs. They're so <laughs> cool. Oh, oh, of course, I need a Les Paul custom. Oh, it's like you know, and and you know, the, and some of the, the the prices are actually very fair and competitive. Yet still, uh, you know, I, I I think, wait, I'm crazy. I I don't really have a job. <laughs> Right. I have very little source of income. I'm beating my head against the wall. But that of course that doesn't change your need for new instruments, as of course you would know. Oh, I don't know anything it's... about credit cards. 
<laughs> well, fortunately, I don't have a oh, credit card. How about you. that? The reason I don't have a credit card is I don't have any way of paying a credit card back. I, 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 I'm. Uh, it's like I can't have. I have to I have to uh, uh, fight the urge to take on any other monthly, you know, a, any monthly responsibilities other than rent and and bills and and the like. Um, you know, of course, it would be great to have a nice car. Okay, you know, yeah. there's more money every uh, month. Trust uh, you know, me, you know yeah, I, mean. I had. You know, when I, I lived in the city, I had an older car. Didn't matter because I didn't drive all that much. Well, I moved out to the country and I, you know, in a year, in 14 months, I put 35,000 miles on my new truck. 35,000 miles in 14 months. Yeah, man. And so uh, I had to. Yeah, that's some serious mileage. I had to, I had, you know, so now I have a payment and it sucks because my. Old yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't and, you know, it. it's fun to drive around in a brand new car. I was riding around in a brand new uh, rental pickup truck the other day. Feels good. And it's kill. It's killer. You know, it's wonderful. And to say the same thing about a, a, a new Les Paul customer or, you know, Firebird or a Explorer or, or whatever, it's like, oh, man, this is radical cool. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, once once the showroom gets open, then I can I can go and play as many guitars as I want right. and, and pretend that I own them all. Let me ask you this, because maybe there's a reason to to my mindset that you know that isn't a problem for you to answer this question. I've I owned one SG in my life. It was like a one of those wide tailpiece, you know, wide bridge '70s jobs. Oh sure, with the I think they call it harmonica bridge. I think it's made by Shaler, That's but right. the big giant one from from like nineteen seventy two. Yeah, it's not very good looking, but sometimes I look at it and it's all right. But anyway, it was an okay guitar. It was a little bit of a pig, but um, you know, the seventies weren't they weren't the the um, you know the epitome of yeah, the Gibson line. They weren't the apex. Um, Perhaps not the apex. Although you'd never know, uh, you'd never guess that by looking at reverb prices. Um, uh, but and then you know, I I, I liked it. Be I liked I like the SG because Frank Zappa, and I like the SG because Angus Young. But there are a lot of people who play SGs, right? And sure, sure, and or have have had an SG as a part of their regular lineup for a period of their career. Um, but only last year did, and I don't know if it's because I saw one at Nam that caught my eye or what it was, but in the last year, it just, all of a sudden, I just think about SG. Like, I never think about Les Pauls right now. I think about SGs. Why? Is there is there a reason, or is it just me? Is there a thing like is Gibson marketing the SG harder, and it's just subconsciously gotten me? Are they making them better? Are that did they reintroduce something that is appealing to me that was gone for a while? Well, that I you know I couldn't answer that question for you. I, you know, for myself, I don't know. It, it, it is an interesting question because I don't know what it is that gets you, you know, you, when I say gets you, I mean me, when it gets one hung up on a particular guitar. Right. You know, like, and because sometimes I'll, I'll just get this idea that I need, uh, you know, a blank. You know, you need a black SG with a long uh, liar engraved vibrola right. black with a white pit guard. And you think, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, I really need that. But then <laughs> like two weeks and later, then, you're still waking up and it's the first thing like, you think about. God, you know, yeah, if I only had a black SG standard 
with you know the long vibrola and a white pit guard and you know that you know that would just make everything that would make everything right i <laughs> All that, the that, world that's okay. would be got, you know, how many guitars? I got zillions of guitars. That, you know, I'll just go pick up something else that that you know, go go up to the attic and pull out something else that I haven't played for a while. You play that, it's like that's cool, that's fun. But if I only <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you go look and maybe there's not even maybe there's nobody that's even played one of those. I guess there's probably one that Angus Young plays. Maybe that could have been actually. <clears throat> there was uh, I think that at one point there was an Angus Young it wasn't a signature model. It was just one that he played that was bl- probably not even black originally that had been refinished black. Maybe it had a white pick card on it. And, you know, maybe I saw it five years ago in a video or maybe I saw it 15 or 20 years ago. And you just keep thinking, man, that looks cool. And of course, it, it, it I don't think it had the arm on it, the vibrato arm even on it. Maybe it could have been folded around back or maybe it was just taken off. And I, you know, I just like, I have to have that. I have to have one. Um, you know, and, and you, you just, it just, it just sticks in your mind. And, and I was down at a guitar store in Portland. This was, you know, a year ago or whatever. And they had a refinished 61 or 62 SG custom that, uh, uh, was a, a beautiful guitar and had been, That's a three humbucker had been refinished model? black. What's that? That's a three humbucker one. Uh, y- y- yes. And, and, uh, and and uh, you know it was just like oh that's you know that there there's and you know it was just super cool sharp cutaways and you know just all the routings all the fine points of it you know it it had been repainted but repainted long long ago and he's like oh yeah we don't really want to sell it we're just kind of holding on to it to try to find out yeah and uh, ultimately it would be it's like it's just stop thinking about this stuff because you're you know Oh, it's like, okay, yeah, well, you could buy it. We decide we're going to sell it. So, yeah, they didn't say this, but it would be, you know, $6,000 or some crazy amount of money. It's right. like, hey, $6,000 guitar, right? Um, then, you know, but then you just keep thinking about it and you're like, well, gosh, uh, maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe all my problems, maybe I would be a new person if I were to have this, <laughs> this guitar. And I keep thinking, well... Yeah, maybe I should see if there's anything I can go trade for that. Maybe I could put a and, and then finally it was back down to Portland. It's like, oh yeah, we decided to, to sell it. Somebody came in and and offered us more than more than we were even thinking. It's like, okay, that's gone. Well, that's good. Um, so I painted an SG black, and I got a white pick card for it, and I found the the you know the makings of the long liar vibrola, <laughs> and I put it together. And and made just that guitar, right? And you know what? My life was better for a long time. It was just great. And it occupied you for a while. Your yeah, it was. It, it was. It was. It, it, indeed, it did. And um, so, I, you know, if 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 I was if I was a rich person, I would be dangerous. Oh, dude! I'd be out there. I'd be like, would, all right. I would definitely okay, need here's a bigger what house. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. For well, for sure. Or I could just give away everything I already have and start over. <laughs> wouldn't that be fun do, uh i probably will have this wrong but do you have a a bunch of wilshers or a bunch of coronets i have a few wilshers few coronets few uh crestwoods you know i, I have a, a, a few uh, and you know just thinking about that you know back uh you know 25 years ago or whatever 25 30 ish you know back back in the a while back you know they were not those were not uh necessarily sought after guitars and but you never saw them either they were not they were not common the you know the 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 uh three and a side cornets and the three and a side wilshires and the three and a side crestwoods you know you just never really saw them um, you know, maybe you'd see pictures of them. There's uh, maybe a picture of Jimi Hendrix playing a, a, a two P nineties Wilshire in, in a picture. It's like, Whoa, that's cool. You know, I never actually seen one of those, you know, because maybe if it was at the store, you know, used guitar store, you, you know, maybe it, it, they sort of weren't really taken that seriously. And uh, then, then you start thinking about it. It's like, well, this is actually actually pretty cool. A two P ninety the Wilshire two P P ninety pickup, basically a Gibson, basically an SG with a, 
you know, stop bar and tunematic and and gumpy um, cutaways and yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, which was you know not actually offered by Gibson at that time. The 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 the, the SG specials had the wraparound, which I still love. I, I have no yeah. problem with that either. Yeah. Um, but but you know you're always looking for something that's the is as as killer as something that is common, but is just a little different enough, you know, to 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 catch your eye. Don't to, to you know, you, it's it still plays like an old buddy, but it you know is a little flashier or a little less flashy. You know, like a one pickup guitar versus a two pickup guitar is cool because it's you know it, because it is. <laughs> and then if you know if it's a a, a custom or a, a Crestwood Deluxe with three pickups, and you're like, oh, God, I gotta have that. And, you know, for up until what, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, you, you could actually find those. They would be hanging up there. And I think the first Wilshire I got was $325 in Seattle. I just happened to be, you know, walking by the guitar store in, in, in Ravenna there. And, and uh, I was like, Holy crap! There's a there's a, a a you know Wilshire that was in fine condition, all original parts. And what's uh, the difference between the Wilshire and the Crestwood? Well, the Wilshire is like a, an SG special, has two P nineties, and you know dot inlay fingerboard. The Wilshire doesn't have a bound fingerboard where the SG special does. Um, and the Crestwood, the Crestwood is a, a little bit of an odd, uh, an odd moniker because it can mean a lot of things. <laughs> like the first uh, Epiphone Crestwoods came out in maybe fifty eight or fifty nine, and they were a big slab body double cutaway guitar with a stop bar and tunematic. Two of the Epiphone uh, single coil pickups. And, um, and yeah, and they and gold hardware and those octagonal knobs. Um, and, and so that's what, that's what it started out at is it was, it was not a three pickup guitar. And then and the, I'm looking at one right now. It's six on a side headstock with the like, right, right. There's, what do we call the, that headstock? It looks like a little spider web. Hold, hold on a hold on a second. The, 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 the cat is, uh, the cat's, the cat's yelling. Hold on one quick second. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry about no, that. The cat right. doesn't like it when I'm when I'm downstairs. She thinks maybe I'm in trouble, and she comes uh, trying to save me. Oh, that's like, good. no, no. I'll be I'll be okay down here. Just just hang out. Good looking out. Um the 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 the, the famous um Crestwood Deluxe, the uh, uh the Radio Birdman guitar, the Dennis Tech guitar, the um the uh, Fred Smith one was kind of the last of those and it has three mini humbuckings um ebony fingerboard six on a side tuners and had the big giant headstock because they used uh the the big full-size grovers on it right um so the headstock had to be giant in order to uh in order to hold those tuners whereas the the lesser ones have the little uh stratocaster-esque tuners the little metal button ones or the plastic button ones, and and so the headstock of those is a little bit more normal shaped, but I mean that that's the coolest one. Well, kind of. I don't know. the uh, The Crestwood Deluxe, the uh, the earlier '60s Crestwood Deluxe with three on a side tuners, is my favorite because it's it's similar. It's similar in a lot of ways to a Wilshire, but it's it's heavier. It's you know it's it's Feels more substantial. you know it's a little bit more of a burlier guitar. The uh, Crestwood Deluxe, the three, the six on the side ones are a little a little non burly, yeah. you might say. And uh, uh, they're great looking guitars. Right, right. They're 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 great looking guitars that you know. I think I think Gibson did a reissue of uh, a U.S. made Wilshire. I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago. Um, that was that was you know regular price to was maybe two thousand dollars or something like that and there was some pretty that seemed like they were pretty cool i never actually saw one um and there was some some epiphone overseas made ones which which were fine as well that were inexpensive uh um and then there's of course the uh the uh, uh um the the uh, cornets 
which there's you know a few different few different versions of that. But the the Wilshires too kind of went from the 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 difference between a Wilshire and a cornet is kind of hard to spot from those later sixties six on the side ones. The uh, um, you know you kind of have to they're 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 pretty much the same guitar as far as I can tell the the. Crestwood Custom, I think it's called, has fancier inlays on the fingerboard and stuff. But uh, am I? N- nothing is cool from the later '60s ones is the uh, Crestwood Deluxe. Am I having a the, flashback, uh, or are some of these guitars, some of these cutaways, almost look like a a Telecaster where there's not where they're both the both the cutaways just get mirrored, right? Um. Yeah. Or yeah. The the like the fifth the '59 era. Epiphones, they're all, they're almost they're, I mean they're thick like a telecaster. They're they're like a they're very much telecaster. But then like a double cutaway telecaster, like you put the same cutaway on either side of a telecaster. But some of them the, body the lower is, bout is is shorter. It's nubbier. Well, on on the thin ones, yeah, yeah. But the 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 first the first epiphone, the first crestwoods and cornets and and I know there's Wilshires like that too, although I've never actually seen one. I would love to have a, a a 59 Wilshire is is a guitar that I've not I've not actually seen. I have a cornet and I have a crestwood, but I do not have I don't have a Wilshire nor have I actually seen one um with P90s with two of those, but they're they're thick like a telecaster and they're basically a double cutaway telecaster made out of mahogany. Um and then in whatever 1960 or 61 they switched to the thinner body more like an SG but still kept the same style of cutaways. And then in, you know, 64 or whatever, they, they changed it. So it is, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the lower string side cutaway is normal. And then the other one is a little nubbier. It looks like they, they reissued these in the nineties. Yeah. There, there was, there's been some reissues, you know, throughout the, throughout the ages of, you know, with varying degrees of authenticness and interest. Right. There's also, well, there's the um, overseas made Epiphone ones from, you know, the 70s. You see those right. all the time right. with the bolt, generally bolt on necks. Probably some of them are, are set necks. Woo! But, uh, here you know, there's, is there's... a 59 coronet, $10,000. Ten thousand dollars. Ten. Well, it's nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. Right, right. It, is that is that the red one? Well, <laughs> I think there's one cherry red one that that this uh, is that's black. at a music store. That, oh, this is at okay, Thunder Road in Seattle. That's crazy. For ten thousand dollars. That's right. Wow. Ten G's. It's huh. in great shape. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it is the epitome of mid-century design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so it's got the gold, gold everything, and the octagonal knobs. Oh, yeah, and the, it's so good looking, and the the uh, wow. the tremolo with the wood plate. Oh, the whoa! It's got it's got the it's got the the ebony uh, tremolo block. Yeah, with the uh, wow, that's like inlay. Sick. It's beautiful. Holy mackerel. Wow. That sounds cool. I got to go. I'm going to run down there and have a look. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yeah, of course, for $10,000, you know. These uh, guitars have have gained a lot of popularity in the last 10 years, yeah? Or even, like, probably more focused just in the last few years. None of these guitars. Yeah, yeah. You were the only person that I knew in the last 20 years that gave two shits about these things, really. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I, I, I the the uh, the uh, the Crestwood that I got, the '59 Crestwood that I got, I got at a guitar show. You know, was it twenty years ago or maybe a little more, give or take? And it was a thousand dollars, and it was up up there sitting on a guitar stand, and I was just you know walking by, da da da. It was like, oh, what the. F is that? And they're oh, it's a it's an old Epiphone. Uh, da, 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 da. It was a Sunburst one. Um, you know, it, so it had it it has the like Les Paul Junior. You know, late the 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 not the red one, of course, but the Sunburst Les Paul Junior. It's that color. You know, it didn't make it. It's might have a little more 
clear coat. It might have a little more shine to it. It might, yeah. you know, they may have taken a little more, more, uh, more, uh, care with the with the with the finish to make it look a little more stellar and you know it wasn't in perfect condition but uh, it was all there and um i, I was just looking at it, it's like well, i've never seen a guitar like that before and the guy's telling me well da, 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 da. it's like <laughs> I, you know you go to guitar store guitar shows you don't necessarily have you know money <laughs> and i was like well i i plugged it in and it had the it has the uh the old new york epiphone pickups which are very low output and very trebly and scritchy and and stuff and i was like well, i don't really have a guitar like this and it sure looks cool i, I guess i have to have it and i was like i might to come up with money then i'm glad i did because it's it's super rad right and uh, um, you could probably sell it now and triple your money Oh yeah, I'm sure. I, sure, I could. It's hard hard to sell stuff though. It's because it's it, if you you know you say I need some money. I, I don't need all these guitars. I should sell You're something. You're a big seller, and then you you go you go get it to go look at it, and then you might think, oh, let me just plug it in and play it for a second. Say like, I can't sell this. I love this guitar. <laughs> so you you have a pretty serious guitar collection. I, you know, serious, you know, I guess that would be for somebody else to decide. Right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of guitars here and I think they're all cool. You know, I think they're all super cool. There, uh, would you classify your collection as players? Probably, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I it, like it, that's not one of the criteria I would have to buy a, a, a vintage guitar is is it in perfect condition of course I that's not, not at all in that. fact i, would, I don't even i would rather it. have some i never even consider yeah, that's, its that's resale not, value like could i sell this well, well we're right and, and plus i'm 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 sort of a bottom feeder it's like i'm not going to go buy something that is at regular price i mean uh, unless i have to i mean you know, unless it's a good deal, there's, I don't need another guitar. It's not like, oh crap, I need a electric 12 string. No, I can pretty much go, I, you know, I pretty much have all the instruments I would need to make uh, music with. So, you know, there's, it's just, you, you get those things in your head. I need a black SG with a white pickguard and a and a liar vibrola you know you 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 can convince yourself of those things but um you don't you know it's that that one's not going to sound appreciably different than the other sg with humbuckers that you have that's not quite as cool right um so and you know unless it unless it's something that i've never seen before and and a and at least a seemingly reasonable good deal the the crestwood that i got i'd never seen one or i didn't even heard of it i didn't even know what it was but it was clear to me that its intrinsic value had to be at least as much as they were asking for it <laughs> and so I, I i didn't hesitate i was like i'll buy this yeah, yeah well let me you know let me stand here and the little things rolling around my head. How am I going to come up with the money to, to pay for this? And fortunately I did. And, and that was great. What year did you say what year those were your first one? The, 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 the Crestwood is like a 59. Maybe it's, it might even be a 58. It might even have an eight as the serial number. Um, and cause I have a, 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 a cornet too of, of similar era, but I think the cornet is is a fifty nine, and I think the Crestwood might be a fifty eight. I I played my friend's fifty nine. I think it's a fifty nine Melody Maker. Did they make it in fifty nine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I it's think a double cutaway one. First, nah, first Melody Makers were a single cutaway until you know until you know whatever sixty three or something, I believe. Hmm. Maybe a... the 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 first the the first year fifty nine Melody Maker is actually a pretty good guitar because they're a little bit burlier. It had a big and they have fat a, a, neck. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the Melody Makers do have pretty big necks. They're they're deep, you know. Not, uh, but double cutaway, no, not not a fifty nine. Hmm. I'll have to go back and look at the pictures. Yeah, yeah. Go 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 rethink that because the 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 fifty nine Melody Maker is is the one. 
Um, there again, some of the, for me anyway, <clears throat> some of the other, the later ones um, are just a little, they're a little light, I think. And, you know, how you, you if, if you're getting an SG, you want one that's on the heavy side because they're thin, you know, and you don't want, you know, you don't, you don't want, uh, you don't want it to seem bendy or wuss, you know, like light. So, you, you know, my theory is you want a, 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 a good solid SG and a Les Paul, you know, there's, there, there's some, some good heavy ones, but definitely you're probably going to like it a lighter one better than a heavier one. If you have your choice, if you're in fish, but the, but fish. ish, <laughs> but the, uh, the melody makers, you know, also they're, they're even thinner than an SG. So right. you're going to, you know, for some for me, I would rather have a, a a burlier one, a heavier one, and the fifty nines are a little bit, a little bit burlier than than the following years. Although I don't have one, but if I did, that would be the one that I would want. For the, so here's a funny thing: I did not think that we were going to get into the history of Gibson and Epiphone instruments, but you knew all this stuff for the most part, before you started working for Gibson. Am I right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Most everything, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. You're a historian. Goddamn historian. In, in, in it, <laughs> well, there's, you know, it, it's... It's easier to be a historian now right. that uh, that the information is all out there, um, but uh, you know, but I just i i like I like those instruments. I think they're 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 great and and fascinating and um, and you know, I'm not sitting there like going, I'm gonna um, today I'm gonna learn about <laughs> the history of the wraparound bridge. Right. It's just years well, and years and years of going to guitar stores and buying it, you know. Yeah. And having guitars and playing other people's guitars and seeing other things and stuff like that. And it, you know, it all it all it starts to make sense the the thought process behind all these things because, you know, let's face it, up until you know, the early fifties, there weren't any solid body electric guitars. I mean, not exactly, but for the, for all intents and purposes, you know, a Telecaster and a Les Paul, those were, you know, that's, that was the, that's, that's, you know, square one. And strangely enough, like the Telecaster, they got that right on the first, uh, on the first, the first try. So I mean, like there's, Nothing, <laughs> you know, nothing that needed to be changed on that, really, as far as I can tell. They, they kind of nailed that. And, you know, the first Les Paul was very close. Yeah. You know, other than the, the neck angle and the and the bridge, they pretty much got that, too. And then they're like, okay, well, we better, you know, we can see the problem of this, you know, the, where the, the 52 Les Paul, where the strings go underneath the bridge, and it's like... Yeah, it was a b- really bizarre idea. Whoever I had came up with that idea, you know, they're probably smacked once and said, that's stupid. Um, but then, you know, when they came out with the wraparound on that, that that's fine. And then putting a two pneumatic on it, you know, I'm sure satisfied, you know, a lot, even more players, even though some of us staunchly love a little wraparound bridge in our they're lives. So good. I will say, I do appreciate that. Modern technology has given us the, you know, the adjustable wraparound. Right, right. It it it, it is a it is a, ultimately a good thing. Right, doesn't and, look nearly as and, cool. Yeah, well, the, the only reason it to me the only reason it it's not as cool is it's it's popular. It's common, you know, like the wraparound bridges and especially those slanted wraparound ones up, you know, from, from before the, uh, yeah. when they changed uh, in the early sixties yeah, yeah, or whatever, yeah. um, you know, are cool. And <clears throat> clearly they, the upgrades that they made to it were very well thought out <laughs> and, and in many ways, totally necessary. 
but the fact, you know, like if you go to a, a show or a club or a, any kind of show and and you see somebody playing a, a junior or a special or even a Les Paul standard with a slanted wraparound tailpiece, you know, you're like, whoa, that dude is cool. You know, it's like driving a car that you know is hard to drive. Right. And the only reason you're driving it is because, you know, you're badass and you're like, it's like yeah, driving an old I can do Willys this. or, you know, some like a, a truck, some kind of cool truck that doesn't have power steering. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's like driving a truck that doesn't have power steering. Right. And I, I, I'm not good with the with the car analogies, but I did a couple of years ago. Somebody said, oh, yeah, we want to uh, film you driving this truck around Ballard. And I was like, okay, that's cool. That's cool. And it was like a early fifties, you know, rackety rackety pickup truck. It's like, yeah, it's a little hard to drive, but you'll figure it out. And, they start, <laughs> and it's like, holy <laughs> crap, this, this thing is a terror. It's like, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, you know, it was just like a, it was like, holy crap. When was the last time I drove a, you know, no power steering, no power, anything. It's like, okay. You know, I, you, you got, you got, you got my, you got me on this oh, yeah, one. They're pigs. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't hurt anyone. So that was good. And I didn't bang it into anything. So, but, uh, but it, it, it is like that. And, you know, there again, if you gave a 54 Les Paul to, you know, somebody who had been playing, a, you know, modern guitar all their lives and they'd be like, well, this is weird. And this bridge, like the string uh, windings will cut my hand. It's like, oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> you know, It'll feel better this... when it stops hurting. Yeah. <laughs> and, the you know, the chrome or the nickel plating is chipping off and there's all so this scratching you know, sharp... You know scratching and the little screws that are coming out of the back of the tailpiece are gouging in your hand. And, you know, maybe it has those tall knobs or maybe it has little pointers on the knob, uh, on the knob, on the, on the pots, oh, you know, yeah. you know, all that stuff. If you see somebody that's actually kicking ass on a, on an old guitar that has all those old appointments on it and hasn't been, you know, safety and, you know, fixed and made, made comfortable. Well, yeah, you can you know, surely it's, it's look like, at their hand and their wrist and probably find a lot of scars and scratches too. <laughs> you, you will find some scars on that. On that. That's uh, like on that. That's like being uh, a lion yeah. trainer, right? Being a lion trimmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, but but. And then even the, you know, people are used to humbucking pickups and, you know, playing a Les Paul with humbuckers and, you know, having like 99 pedals and stuff. And, and you hand them that 54 Les Paul with, with sort of low output, uh, uh, P90s in it. And, you know, like zing, 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 it's like, I can't play this. Listen to all that noise. Like, yeah, but, you know, you look at, you know, who's a, who's a good somebody who's played you know p90 pickups you know you don't hear P90s. you don't hear pete townsend you know having gross amounts of hum between every note he plays you know you, fig- you figure out a high gain amplifier either well you, you listen to some of the who live at leeds and you tell me that's not at least fairly high gain at times yeah, yeah sure you know not not as high gain as 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 you know some things that would to follow that, right. but at the time that was probably bombastic. That was that was bombastic. You know, and listen to uh, you know Black Sabbath first records, and it's like you know. But there again, like you you knew what the problems were, and you know even in in my day, like doing recording sessions, and you get a, a, a guitar player that has maybe an SG Junior or something like that, oh. and and you can't get a good recording of it. Because it hum, you know, it hums so much when they're not playing, and so you'd like put marks on the ground of where you have to stand, and you have to rotate this way, you know, and and stand a certain way. And I think even at one point we considered making a uh, little a little metal cage and insulate a uh, 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 RF cage for somebody really to stand in so they could play the guitar and it wouldn't pick up radio and it wouldn't hum quite so much. But, uh, you know, the, if you're, if you're, if that's your sound, if that's your style, then you just figure out how to turn it down when you're not playing it, you know, and routinely you just like, you see the people that play juniors and you know, their, their bottom of their pinky is always on that volume control. And, you know, if they're, they're singing, it zoop goes down. And then, you know, when it's time to, when it's time to let it rip, it comes up and 
It's just, you know, if, if, if that's what you want to do, you just learn how to make that work for right. you. And, you know, there's so many ways around it. All you have to do is get a guitar that doesn't have, that has humbuckers in it and, and not worry about it anymore. But Boring. It, or just, you Deal know, with it. just subscribe to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what weird guitar, the one weird guitar, cause I've almost only, I've almost exclusively played weird guitars mm -hmm. right i'm kind of mm -hmm. for whatever reason i don't go for convention the few times that i've tried to they've you know it's uh, i've had varying degrees of success but one guitar that i had a real hankering for and i found one at a at a shop in chicago i didn't buy it i went back the next day after the show or whatever and looked looked at it again, didn't buy it. It was $300 in 2000. I should have bought it. <laughs> it's $300 and you went back and didn't buy it. I went back and looked at it and was like, hmm, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, it's an Epiphone scroll. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. With the, with the, the scroll, scroll uh, top uh, cut. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I still think about that guitar and every once in a while, you know, only, I only have a hankering for it when, when it's not around, of course. Uh, I played one at one point and I didn't love it, but, uh, hold on. <coughs> have you ever put your hands on one of those things? <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. No, I, I don't know if I've ever even seen one of those scroll guitars because those were They're really <clears throat> weird. Those must have been from, you know, the, the early mid 70s, yep. right? Yeah. I'm guessing, you know, just 73, 74. Didn't, uh, was that like Pete Cozy from the, uh, from Miles Davis? Didn't he play one oh, of those? I don't know. I think that's, I think that was, you know, like in, in, uh, you know, it was, you know, just one of those weird <laughs> guitars that they probably made for one or two years. I actually don't know much about those instruments, but I've never had one and I've never, never actually played one. But, you know, if, if, if I, if I was at a guitar store, you know, an hour from now and walking around and saw one hanging up for $300, you know, I'd have to. Well, have yeah, that. I wouldn't because pass on they, one. There was set neck guitars. Again. They were, they were pretty, you know. They were a serious instrument, I think. I think that they're still... I think you can still get one for $1,000 or less. Mm -hmm. You know. $1,000 is a big difference from $300 in my book. $300, you know, well, like... Well, that was 20 anything, years ago. Right, right. That's true. So $300 then was probably, you yeah. know, about... This, probably about the same <laughs> as $1,000 now. <laughs> you know, so... I mean, $300 felt thinking, like $1,000 to me. Yeah. <laughs> whether it, hey man whether <laughs> your three hundred dollars back then is like uh uh seven hundred and sixty six forty four to me now that's correct sir. <clears throat> but but that's just, that's just my math uh, side taking over <laughs> well as it will uh what was your very first guitar do you still have it i do have of my first course guitar you do <clears throat> and um it is a, a a Japanese SG copy, really, um, made by <clears throat> made by Pan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember any of the of Pan course. guitars, but uh, I think I, I never saw Pan Les Paul. I know yeah, there's sort of Arabian uh, Pan font, SGs, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You got that. Uh, I've seen a Pan uh, three thirty five style guitar. Yeah. <clears throat> And when I was little, gosh, it would have been, you know, maybe I was 14 or 15. And, you know, I was like, I, I was borrowing my sister's acoustic guitar. And I took, uh, when I, when I, when I started high school, um, you know, it was like like when when we were in 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 junior high school, you you just got your classes. You you know, you you got what you got, 
And then, uh, you know, first year in high school, it's like, oh, there's electives. So you need to take your math and you need to take your blah, 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 blah. You need to take your regular things, but you can also pick your classes. And it's like, you know, looking at things like folk guitar. It's like, geez, you can, you can learn how to play guitar in, school? in high school. That's, that's just crazy. So check that box for sure. And then, you know, you have to run or when they, when you sign up for classes with, oh, okay, this is a tennis shoe registration. So you go to the different things and sign up for the class. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't know any of these things. Um, but I got in the folk guitar class to, to begin with. And it was like, oh, that's cool. Oh, well, I don't have a guitar, but my sister had an extra acoustic guitar. And like, you can take this one. You can use that. So I brought that. And, uh, you know, by, I guess that would have, when does school go in session? Uh, September. Mm. Yeah. And by Christmas of that year, I was like, well, you know, I love playing this acoustic guitar and I'm, you know, learning how to play guitar and, and that's fantastic. Um, you know, I'd sure love to have an electric guitar. And, you know, my dad, who was, was much like myself, but not, not centered, not, not music centric, but, um, you know, he was a smart man. He's like, well, let's, let's talk to some people and see what would make a good acoustic or a good electric guitar for you. And, um, you know, everybody, pretty much everybody said the same thing. It's like, don't go buy a cheap new guitar. If you don't have much money, find a, a good solid old guitar that's still in good shape. That's, you know, the same price as a, as a cheap new of guitar. Course. And <clears throat> It'll it'll be better and you'll you'll like it and it'll it'll hold its value better and and all those things. Um and and you know it's like how how do people that don't know anything about guitars shop for guitars like or used guitars especially, um, and w of course we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended I ended up with the Pan SG, and that's probably um, a pretty good little guitar though. It's you know it's oh, bolt in, on, yeah. Uh, it, not necessarily, um, and so whatever year that was, nineteen seventy five or seventy six, um, you know, played 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 on it for a while, and and it was fine. It was like clearly, you know, listening to the first performances of of my first band, it's absolutely clear i mean there was no pedal tuners there was no there was no tuners of any sort back then and we certainly Strobe did not tuner. let that stop us from not being we you know if we had little tuners back then things might have been a little bit different but you know there was no information i didn't have any mentors to help me learn how to play guitar or anything like that and you know it was just so it's just a disaster it was never in tune it never uh you know whether it was the guitar's fault or not you know it's probably you know 99% user error um but uh, uh so the first thing you know the first thing you do it's like oh oh yeah it must be these tuning pegs well they got to go and so you tear the tuning pegs off and <laughs> take some tuning pegs from another crappy yeah. guitar and put them on thinking oh the tuning pegs on this one are bad they they must be crappy so i'll put these other ones on <laughs> oh yeah the reason it doesn't sound good is you got to put a different pickup in it so like you know oh this pickup doesn't fit and you know, I, how hard would it have been to ask dad to help me with that? No, I'm going to do that myself. And you, you know, get a chisel and a, a hammer and <laughs> make the hole a little bit bigger and put the different pickup in there. And it's also out of a terrible guitar and, uh, and, and crappy and, oh, I better change this. I better do this. And, you know, I better make it look, I better customize it because a lot of, a lot of guitar players I like have things that are customized. And fortunately I left all that stuff on. It's still got the, uh, it's not a pan pickup, but it's, uh, from another 335 copy, maybe, uh, not much different than the pan, but, uh, um, you know, whether it was a trade up or, or, or down, I don't really know, but it's got the different pickup in it and the different knobs and the, you know, little, uh, letter set letters rubbed on it and stuff like that. And, and, uh, yeah, that still have is it. Crazy. I wish I still had my first guitar, uh, but I do not. But I mean, I guess if my first guitar was a, if I had, you know, got a Gibson or Epiphone guitar as my first guitar, I probably wouldn't have it anymore because I would have had to, uh, I would have had to sell it to get the next guitar I got, which was in fact a double cutaway Melanie Maker. Oh. Um, 
you know, and and after after a couple of years of playing on the pan, and then having meeting some friends and playing on other people's guitars, maybe they had a a, a three thirty five or a Les Paul or <clears throat> some other nicer guitars, and you're like, okay, yeah, I, I get. I think I get the difference between these. Like I plug my pan SG copy in, and it just just squeals instantly. It just like, <laughs> and then you plug in your buddy's Les Paul, and it you know just sounds nice, and it's not. Squ- screechy and, and stuff it's like okay okay so i need i need a gibson guitar okay and then you go you know you don't you know you don't go online you open up the newspaper and right. you know, say oh you know uh gibson guitar 125 dollars. like oh i'll go have a look at that you take the bus down to see it and um and uh you know it was this melody maker and I didn't really, you know, of course you don't, you don't really know if you're a teenager. It's like, well, it's a Gibson guitar. So it's made by the same company that made my buddy's guitar. And it had the, and you know, the single Kiss coil plays. pickup. And the... yeah, yeah, exactly. So it is the best yeah. according, according to Kiss. And, you know, I do, I do believe Kiss Alive had come out at that point. So we were well aware of, you know, what you do if you want the best right. is you go, is you go get the best. Yeah, the best isn't going to come and, knocking um, on your door. No, no. If you want the best, you you go get the best, and um, and so I got that, and and it and it played really nice, you know. But it's still, you know, you still just wanted it to sound like you know UFO or you know, you know sound like Michael Schenker or Black Sabbath or you know you want it to sound like tough or even like the Ramones. You know, it's like, well, how do I, how do I get, how do I get that sound like? You know, even the the Ramones' first couple of records, you know, it's like, well, it doesn't really make that sound. And then somebody says, "Oh, you need a distortion pedal." It's like, well, I don't see, I don't see any of the bands that I go see. They don't seem like they have distortion pedals. You know, they just seem like they have. There's just that sound comes out of them. Yeah, oh, well, you know, whatever. You need a distortion. So I remember American Music was up on uh, up on Fremont, up on Finney Ridge. And you know, I didn't. I didn't have any money. I didn't know anything about anything. I walked in. It's like I. I think I need a distortion pedal. And of course, I was shy. I didn't really want to engage with any people. I didn't want to sound dumb. But you know, you want to. You want some help. But I don't know how to ask for help. Right. You know, I should have just gone and say, "I want to sound like uh, Michael Schenker and the Ramones." <laughs> <laughs> and they would look at me like, "What are you talking about?" Um, what an like, awesome what, combination of things to want to sound like. <laughs> yeah. I want to sound like I want to sound like Michael Schenker and the Ramones. It's like get out of here. You're you're a confused kid. Um and uh and so they're like, "Well, this is the cheapest distortion pedal we have or fuzz pedal or whatever." And it was a uh it was a a, a Big Muff, the script Big Muff. Yeah. And it was $35. Mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, well that's cool. I have $35." So I, you know, bought the big muff and put a battery in it and plugged in. It's like, well, it still doesn't sound like Michael Shaker <laughs> in the remote. But it sounds cool. But but it's it sounds pretty cool. Like, okay, let me let me hang with this. Let me see see where this goes. And um, you know, played with that for a little bit, but then I was like, but you know, it it, it it's still it's still it still kind of bugs me in a way. It doesn't it doesn't really look right. So then I thought, well, maybe what I need to do is <laughs> figure out a way to make it so it didn't look like I was playing through a, a you know, a, a sheet metal big distortion pedal. It, it somehow I don't even know why. Maybe just because none of the guitar players that I knew and liked at that time, you'd never see them with a big muff or something. You'd see these big giant distortion pedals, fuzz pedals, or whatnot. And so I remember taking it apart and trying to build it into the amp so so that that so that you didn't see it <laughs> and then, then i thought well that's kind of cool but then i need an on off switch so i just took the you know the wires from the on off switch and ran them through a cable and put a made a little wood thing with the switch in it you <laughs> and, did all this did to your amplifier course, well, no, the, well, the, the, well i did start doing that later um this is this is this is before van halen you know, like once Van Halen came out, everything changed. You know, everything sort of tilted another, you know, 180 yeah. degrees. Um, but then, you know, then, uh, you know, and I, I there again, I could ask my dad, 
it's like, can I do this? And he would have gone, um, no, this won't work because, you know, you've got this, you know, you've got this, this, uh, guitar, you got this low level signal. You can't send it to a switch, you know, that's 20 feet away and then back, um, through a non shielded cable, right. <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, it's just a switch. That doesn't need to be shielded cable. So I did that. And then I thought, Oh, that's crappy. Jeez. I just ruined everything. So I just took the whole thing and threw it in a box and forgot about it. Fortunately, I found it, you know, years later and just unhooked the switch and put everything back the way it was. And the big muff still works. Really? So that's good. Um, <clears throat> but it's like, well, you know, whatever I was looking for, you know, you just, you just see the people on TV and see the people, you know, that you go to concerts and they just, they're just shredding. And, you know, if they have a pedal, it doesn't, it doesn't look like the one that I had, you know, there's just this magic sound. It's like, Oh, Oh, they're Marshalls. Okay. That's what I would, Cause you know, maybe even I had a twin reverb pretty early on and it just, you know, you just, it just doesn't, doesn't do the you can same turn it up and at all. It just doesn't, it's just not the, it's just not the same thing. It's like, no, though this, you know, but it was, it was inexpensive and it did work. And I remember even bringing it to somebody and saying, Oh, you know what is there, you know, uh, trying to explain, you know, I should have, I, you know, if, if I was smart, I would have got a paper route and saved up and bought a Marshall. You know, duh, and a Les Paul or a Les Paul Junior or SG or something like that. But you know, a lazy kid. You know, I had a lot of I had a lot of big ideas, but that doesn't mean you have a lot of money. Right. Or, you know, you, 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 <laughs> that, no, everything's a little skewed. Right and then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, and, 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 and it's like, well, how do I how do I get this? How do I get this sound? And um, you know. Clearly, the, the the way to get that sound, and we'd go see bands, and there'd be somebody with a Les Paul Junior and a Marshall plugged right into it, and it's like, well, that's that's the sound I want. Just the, you know, that's you know, that's that's what I want. But you know, Les Paul Junior was five hundred bucks, a Marshall head was five hundred bucks. I'm like, I don't have five hundred bucks, so you're doing anything you can to make that happen. And of course, it it doesn't exactly work, but. You know, I guess that's that's why interesting things happen, I suppose. And then once then once, you know, we got the first Van Halen record, I was like, uh oh. <laughs> you know, how do you how do you get that sound? And, you know, it uh, clearly took a few years for, for anyone to figure out how to get Some that people sound. Are still doing it. Well, no, no doubt people are still, you know, chasing that. But, uh, you know, the, the, the Eddie Van Halen signal chain is pretty well, pretty well documented at this point, which it wasn't back then. You just, I mean, we didn't, I was just talking to a buddy the other day. We didn't even see, I think the first time Van Halen played here was 1979. Did you and see the show? So we had that first record and just like, holy Did crap, you see the what? show? Yeah, I saw most of it. You know, I did, I didn't, or not even most of it, but uh, there was the, uh, it was, you know, whatever the date was, it was in 1979 and it was, you know, one of the most rock and roll moments of all time, um, at the Paramount Northwest in Seattle, the, the bill and, you know, maybe, some, maybe somebody else was there and somebody was, saw that whole show at the Paramount that night. The bill was Judas Priest opening. A band who I can't remember was middle and UFO was the headliner. Now it's like, for sure, we're not missing that show. So we bought a ticket for that. And uh, we all, you know, bought tickets for that. But then also Van Halen was playing at the Seattle Center Arena, which is now gone, but <clears throat> like, well. Just a few blocks away, that one, wow. the one that turned into whatever it is, uh, the Nike what is, store or something. What is the uh, 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 what, what's the one that? that turned into like uh, the Banana Republic or the Nike store or something like that? The one that was downtown or uh, the arena? Well, uh, the oh, the, uh, the the Seattle Center Arena, which gotcha. was on the Seattle yeah, yeah. Center grounds, and I, I can't remember what it turned into. What was that place <laughs> I don't called? Even know downtown. what's there? Oh, I thought well, it was there was called the Paramount. The it was down. Over there, uh, down from the Paramount, and it was a theater. And did they did they have? But I swear it was called the Arena. Was it the Was it a movie theater or a rock? Well, it was a music a rock venue, venue, right? 
Downtown. And I, I think it's a retail store now, like a big one. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, that of course that's that's all there is down there now. There's there's very little rock and roll in in, in oh, downtown really? Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've they've strange, but they've removed most of rock and roll from downtown Seattle. But uh, so. It's like, well, Judas Priest in 1979, oh, yeah. it's like, get out of here. It's like not possible that I was not going to go to that because like, I believe it was their first time here too. And we'd loved Judas Priest since Sad Wings of Destiny. They were oh. like, you know, just the, uh, like the greatest, you know, the greatest record of its ilk. Well, we listened to you a know, lot a, of uh, Rockarola and Sad Wings in this house. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rockarola, great. Fucking sin after sin. It's like... Ah, God, um, and it is a rock and roll it too. I mean, I, I, I love that record. So it's, psychedelic. It's, it's 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 something else. But so you know, whatever their record was at that time, was it uh, um, entry stained class maybe? But you know, not possible to miss Van or not possible to miss Judas Priest. So we went to that, and you know, mind absolutely blown 100 percent mind blown and then we're like, and I was, we were like i forget who we were all hanging out with well we got to go see van halen it's like well we got to get back here for the uh for the uh, uh ufo um because ufo too i mean we'd seen ufo a few times because they were you know they they had toured and they were were pretty well you know regarded in the northwest here and uh, so we so we cruise over. We didn't have tickets for Van Halen, but um, you know we we were pretty good at sneaking into venues at that point. And uh, and it didn't take us long to get into uh, in, into the arena. Somebody you know like in the hallway opened the door, and we you know you just have to run past the security guards. Which you know if you're sixteen or seventeen, 18, probably you're faster probably than the pretty security. Pretty good at that. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. And so we get in there and I'd never, you know, I'd never seen anything like Van Halen in 1979. It's like, holy shnikey, you know, what, what is, what's going on here? You know, it it was like nothing, you know, just blazing guitar and blazing drums. And, um, you know, before the, before the, before the set was over, Eddie Van Halen is, you know, just running full throttle into these, you know, amp stacks. And, you know, we were, we were kind of looking a little bit onto the side so we could see there's dudes behind the amp stacks holding it back. They know he was going right. to do this at that point, of course. And so they're there making sure he doesn't knock him over. It's like, no, I've never seen these rolling around on the ground. It was like, after just seeing Judas Priest for the first time. <laughs> And I'm just my 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 brain is just on fire with same this. night, same night, and uh, and then uh, you know Van Halen finishes and they come back for their encore and they do you really got me but but when we noticed earlier because we'd never seen Van Halen but we noticed that that David Lee Roth didn't look like he was all happening look didn't really look like he was all all together. And we thought, oh, yeah, fuck, he's wasted, dude. <laughs> cool. You know, um, and then he didn't come back for the encore and and the uh, the Van Halen brothers and, and Michael Anthony sang You Really Got Me as their encore, if if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we're like, whoa, we've never seen a show where the guy wasn't there. <laughs> I wonder if he was really in that bad a shape. I mean, I... He well, wasn't the kind of the star- partier that the other guys were, right? Well, you know, of, of course, I, I don't know those people, so I don't really know what they're like. But the story, the story goes on. Oh, do tell. And uh, so, so they finish. <laughs> they finish. You really got me. And you know, my mind is just going a million miles an hour. I've just had my mind blown one hundred percent. I saw uh, uh, KK Downing and Glenn Tipton throw their guitars across the stage to each other. You know, play lead on each other's guitars, throw them back. <laughs> then I go see Van. Uh, I was just like, I've never, I've never seen any. You know, this I've never seen this before. And uh, it's like, oh, but hold on, the Scorpions or not Scorpions, the uh, UFO. Are, are still going. So we, we go back to the Paramount, somehow find a parking place, uh, 
and our tickets are not good anymore, but we knew how to get in there pretty easily. So we climb up the, open the door to the, the exit door to the fire escape, climb up there, blah, 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 ching, 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 do our thing, get back in there, watch UFO play. And, you know, whatever record they were, were had out in 1979, I'm, uh, I'm spacing out slightly. Um, mind blown, loved UFO, like top rank band. Great, 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 great. It's like, but then, oh, let's go, let's go see if we can find Van Halen. After the show, you're so just going to see if you, you know, can find the band? Yeah, let's go see if we can find Van Halen. So with the, whatever the first hotel we went to downtown, you know, where the rock band stayed, it was clear there was, you know, a ton of kids there looking for autographs and stuff. It's like, okay, this has got to be where Van Halen are. Um, so we're waiting around, waiting around, waiting around, and, and, uh, and all of a sudden, they the two bodyguards come in with a uh, with third bodyguard in front of them, pushing everyone out of the way. It's like, get the hell out of here! You know, pushing through. And they've got David Lee Roth, one bodyguard under each arm, and he's still in his outfit that he played the show in. Chaps. And uh, <laughs> some uh, some kid runs up with a, a half of a Ovation acoustic guitar that he played uh, Ice Cream Man on, and 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 you know smashed it and threw it out in the audience. And you're looking for an autograph, and one of the one of the bodyguards just pushes him out of it. <laughs> Get out of there! You know, and they 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 go straight for the elevator and uh, and get in the elevator, and you know you weren't getting close to that guy at all. Period. Right. And um, we're like, whoa. You know that guy really is wasted, and uh, you know because of course David Lee Roth, you know sp- he's supposed to be wasted all the time. So without that, that guy really is wasted. That's weird. You know we didn't think that that would ever happen. Um, and uh, then you know at some point you know a couple, maybe the, a couple other the band guys came in, but they also had bodyguards, and it was like well, this is not very fun, right? Not so happening. Let's, let's just. Yeah, that, that that's not happening. So you know, we just went out, went back out, and did whatever we did. And it's like, wow, what a night! You know, what a what a what a wild night of rock and roll. And then, you know, maybe you, just not that long ago, within the last year or two, I was like, when was that show? You know, and I started looking on the internet, and um, and, and clearly, Van Halen and UFO played the same night, but I never found out who the middle band was in the UFO mystery band Judas Priest really? show. It's, you know, seemingly not not accessible through any of the And it was no things. one that you and, you didn't know who it was. So it wasn't like a local, it wasn't like fucking. No, Q5 no, it was, no, we something. did know who it was, it was like, and it was it was it was a killer band, and and we would have no problem hanging out there, other than the fact that we wanted to see Van Halen too. I mean it was, it was April. It was, would have been a killer band. That well, it it could you triumph. Know, it would could have been no, it wouldn't have been triumph because it was seventy nine. I don't think I don't think triumph rated at that point. April wine, you know, we would yeah. have dug that for sure. So it was. It seems like I don't think it was April wine, but it would have been somebody of that stature. Yeah. You know, like a band that we liked. I mean, the bill was killer enough for us to actually buy tickets for it. Um, but uh, then we found then I you know, look on the, the Van Halen uh, tour you know, dates are a little easier. They're better recorded and they're better easily accessible. And, um, and it's like, Oh, that was the, during the day of that show, I went up to, I think it was called music market or something out on Aurora. And there was a Van Halen meet and greet at a record store. And, uh, and I just went by myself and it was just, it was a madhouse. There was so many long haired, you know, dudes and long haired chicks there. And you know, I was like, wow, this is, almost too much for me to uh to handle just thinking it's like well we love van halen and you know but we're we're special you know maybe not everyone else likes them too but they were they were mega at that point even then so wait were they Um, on tour for their first record i think i think van halen 2 must have been out by that point and were they headlining Um, yes yeah they were the headlining band had i mean that's I guess that just doesn't happen very often anymore, right? You're like where it within the first or second record you're headlining a lot of right, right, right for sure. Um, and because I remember, I think it was Kim Warnick well, for sure it was Kim had the first Van Halen record, um, but she only had a she had a cassette. It was like a a, a cassette from the record. 
And she's like, oh yeah, this band is, is cool. Cause you know, we didn't, didn't really know, you know, it was, it was not really the Van Halen. The band was not really in our radar right away. <clears throat> And, um, you know, Kim had her mom's, uh, mom's car that she, I don't know if she drove to school in, but, you know, after school, we'd go just drive around and listen to cranked up stereo on the cassette player. And, um, and she had Van Halen one, which I'd never heard before. And, you know, just putting it on and listening to that first side, Uh I was like, oh, whoa, I, you know, for being a, you know, however old I was, 17 year old guitar player kid. It was, it was, you know, it was, it was just like, it was a whole, it was a whole new thing that, uh, you know, it's like, this is, this is, this changes everything. It's like, I, I just don't even, I don't even know where to start with this. And then I, it's like, I've got to get this record, you know? So, you know, within the couple of days after hearing it, go to the record store and flip through. It's like, oh yeah, Van Halen. Uh oh! And you look at the cover; it's like, oh, I was afraid of this. You know that they're that they were, uh, you know, like they were metal looking. Because you listen to that record, and and they could they could be kind of punk rock looking, right? You know, you, it was it was not absolutely clear what that band's look would be from listening to them. I mean, they were just like a barrage of you know just Mayhem. everything. And I remember looking at it and thinking like. Uh oh, oh boy! And I bought it. Of course, I bought it. But I'm just thinking, boy, all the 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 all our punk rock friends are not gonna like this. But let me let <laughs> and me of ask course you they this: didn't. you you also were into Prague and all kinds of stuff. It's not like you had an exclusive relationship with punk rock. Am I right? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we just we loved so many different things, um, and but the the you know all the small shows that we the the only the only bands you know the only time you could go to a, a small place and see a band. I mean, we weren't twenty one. We weren't going to the bars and seeing you know the uh, the rock and roll. You know, da, 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 right. you know the the bar bands. We were out of our we're out of our orbit. But we could go see, you know, people's hall shows of punk bands and and stuff like that. But that was that was the only direct, you know, music you'd get. You could go see bigger shows, but you're not standing right in front of the person playing the guitar. You you know yeah. what I mean? So so the the, the uh, you know for some some somehow and and punk music was at at the uh, at the. Uh, at the uh, upper end of our ability at that point, even though listening to, you know, listening to the recordings of the, the cheaters are are our first band, you know, we, we wanted to be punk rock because we loved that, you know, the, the energy of, in the kick-ass factor of punk. But at the same time, you know, we were, you know, no wonder people didn't really like us back then. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, I've got an idea for this song. The first minute I was going to be like supercharged punk, and then it's going to have this really quiet um, instrumental part, and then it's going to go into this other part. And, it, you know, and that was not part of the, uh, the oeuvre of, of uh, punk bands at that point, and, and maybe not even the oeuvre of our band at that point point and you know so there was lots of arguing it's like i'm not doing that that's but if you were gonna do something like that that. seattle was a was a pretty good place to do it right well i wouldn't know i mean it's where i grew up so you know i didn't didn't get out of seattle you know for for a while you didn't really you could read in in you know some magazines what it was like in la and san francisco um but you know there there was the the was bird a the punk small club community, in, though. in so Seattle. Seattle back then was just like a large town. It was a it was, it was well a city, I, but... I, I don't even know if it was large. I don't even know that. I think it was kind of a medium sized right. town, and it was it was so far away that we didn't get you know the the touring bands that liked it here. I know that ACDC is 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 one that uh, you know the first time they came up here. Um, we're like, oh, we gotta say ACDC. There's no, not even any question about that. And they played ACDC. Uh, uh, I think it was um, 
Dog Eat Dog from uh, Let There Be Rock was on the radio when that record came out, which would have been 1977, I think. And uh, and so, you know, like there was some of the bands, I think Rush, ACDC, there was some bands that, you know, had a firm foothold. But other than that, it was so far to travel, you know, Portland, Oregon, you know, maybe you had some following there. But, you know, it's so far away from San Francisco. It's so far away from Minneapolis. It, you know, it was, a, it was a long way to go if you're going to go and nobody knows who you are and nobody cares. Um, But... So, you know, we, we only knew what we knew and you could watch TV and you could read magazines, but, uh, and, and, you know, maybe we were a little young at the time when, when punk came out, like the first punk club was opened in, uh, March, 1978 in Seattle and, you know, it was all fascinating. It's like, well, these guys, this, these guys gave us our first opportunity to play. If it wasn't for them, we may never have had a band. We may never have done anything. Um, and people were supportive of us, but we were just a bunch of jackass kids and probably didn't appreciate things very much. And, you know, screwing around and breaking stuff and just being stupid. Um, but, and so some people probably, uh, disdained our existence and, other people must have seen some value in it because we were able to play. Right. You know? uh, but, and, but, 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 and, and, you know, there was a lot of people that were slightly, you know, maybe two or three years older than us that, you know, that did, you know, that did give us a chance and that, that, that's fantastic. But I, I, I don't, I don't think at the time, uh, you know, it's hard to grasp what it was like back then, even for myself, because the only perspective, you, you know, had. I didn't have anything to compare it to, but I don't know. I don't know if it was a big, I don't know if it was a, a, a large city or not. It seems, seems to me like it was just kind of a, another city, you know, and it happened to be far away from all the other, another cities. Right. And so I think a lot of things didn't happen here. Was it, uh, which on a scale of one to 10, 10 being super weird, uh, and one being not weird at all. How weird was it to not be a grunge band during the grunge, the quote grunge thing? The grunge, grunge the era. grunge explosion, Seattle's grunge explosion. The first time I heard, so, you know, I didn't grow up in Seattle. I grew up in Granite Falls, but I would take the bus to Everett and go to Budget Tapes and Records and get the Rocket Magazine and read about all the bands. And I would save up some money and I would buy some tapes and some records. And But I never saw any shows. You know, I didn't, I didn't know much. I didn't, didn't know more than what I read in the Rocket. And... Right, right, first, right. And, I remember the first time I heard the word saying, grunge. I was like, I felt like I already knew what it meant. Do you know what I mean? Just like when you hear the word, I was like, oh yeah, I know what that means. Oh yeah, for for sure. The the, the phrase the the word grunge is is perfectly applicable in that in that case. Um, <clears throat> I may have even and, read it in the sub pop. You know, whatever that the call. Yeah, yeah. They had the. Before it, where maybe it was a label, but it was just like a, it was an article in the, in the in the rag, right? In the rocket. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a, it was a, a, a I think it was Bruce Pavitt's uh, music column right. in the rocket sub pop. You know, maybe whenever sub pop one hundred that first comp came out, you know, eighty seven, maybe eighty six, even. <clears throat> and um, yeah, it it was. It was just it was just a column, and you know I knew Bruce Pavitt worked at a record store up on Capitol Hill, so I'd go in and have a chat every now and then, and y you know you'd just uh, you know you just um, but then the grunge explosion. I don't know. I think at when the grunge explosion happened, if we want to assign a date to that of what 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 year did grunge explode? Uh, Eighty nine, ninety, ninety one. I 91. mean, it swelled. Uh, but I don't think that it exploded until until ninety two. Till never mind, yeah, perhaps at least 90, 92. Never mind. I think was I would consider that the explosion. The the explosion, but there there was you know there was much swelling and yeah. um, 
We were, you know, by 1992, we were firmly, you know, off and running again. Um, and by that point, by 1992, we had been, the Fastbacks had been a band for 12 right. years. I guess that's, that's <laughs> the subtext in my question. Like, how weird was it to just go all the way through that? be respected and embraced by by all of those bands but not be and be a part of the music community but not be nothing like it right right you know it, it never i don't i don't know if we ever thought about it it was i think you know it's not like the like me and Kim and Lulu ever had meetings where we'd sit down and talk right. about our music direction. Or Wait a minute, who like was that. the MD in the I mean, really, band. we just... <laughs> yeah, I might have been, in some ways, the musical director, um, but we just did what we did. And, you know, if I came in with a song, I mean, there's some pretty weird... I, I just put out a remixed version of uh, the Fastback's Zucker oh, record. Rad. Which I, you know, it just during at the beginning of the pandemic, and I was digging through crap, and you know, found the 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 master tapes for that that those sessions, and just decided to instantly decided that that was a good project, not even knowing that I do it or whatever, and just listening to it, and the, the, these recordings were done at the end of 1991 and early 1992. And, uh, you know, exactly where, when the uh, groundswell and explosion was happening. And it's just a myriad of things, you know, so many ideas and, and, you know, you, some of them might've taken hold and some songs that we would have played later throughout the nineties or whatnot. And, and a lot that, oh, this is done. Okay. Well, we're done. Okay. You know, and you just did things. And nobody, nobody, really nobody stopped to think, is this a good idea or (laughs) is this like more confusing than it is valuable or, you know, anything like that. And I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, we were pure of thought and, and unified in our drive or anything like that. Cause we definitely were not. Um, It was just this scattershot, weird combination of people that, you know, had no direction other than whatever, whatever worked and whatever, whatever happened good. seemed like it was pretty good. If it got to the point of getting finished, then it, oh, well, if it got finished, then it must be pretty good <laughs> <laughs> without ever, you know, there was no, nobody really thought about things that much. I guess we just, just sort of did right. stuff. And, you know, that was probably good in a lot of ways and probably not good if you want to be a successful band you know, maybe not the best idea, kids listening to this. <laughs> maybe <laughs> don't do as I did. Um, but, you know, the, and then we didn't, it didn't have any, you know, like, oh, yeah, we'll play a show with Mud Honey for sure. They're, they're buddies. Why, you know, and I, I think in a lot of ways, the bands back then, you know, didn't, they weren't for the most part, unless they were tongue in cheek, they weren't out there pushing the grunge agenda. They just like, you know, everybody in bands love music and, and not everybody in a band that played grunge music liked only grunge music for sure. Of course. Um, and so it's like, well, we got asked to do great shows and did lots of fun things and, and people seemed to like us and, and, uh, and, and stuff. And, you know, we were, if we were never part of the grunge explosion, but we did, you know, go on a sub pop package tour to Japan in 1993, you know, along with the, the super suckers and super snaz and seaweed who I guess, you know, I guess by that point it was probably, you know, okay, here's the the next wave of your new favorite right. music that are all friends with people who play in bands that are called grunge or something like that. Um, you know, the, it, it, it's just funny to see, uh, to see, our, you know, even we were buddies with, with bands that were getting courted by record labels and, you know, we'd get a call. I remember one, 
and I forget. Uh, oh, we're uh, the we're taking the Melvins out to dinner, and they asked if you wanted to come to their dinner, or you know, like weird things, or you know, Flop is getting courted by a label, and uh, and well, do you want to come to our dinner with us? You know, <laughs> people sort of hated at once hated that kind of attention, but didn't want to, you know throw it away and i do i do remember for some reason going to a melvin's record label courting dinner and definitely a few flop ones and and at no point did we even think it's like wait how come nobody's courting us how come we never got asked to do one major label (laughs) record dinner you know it's like you know there's wait there's a thing about the 90s and if you were active in the nineties where you tried and you worked hard and you practiced and you played shows and you did the whole thing. Right. But then you also thumbed your nose. Maybe it was like, you know, it was like the reverberation of punk rock, you know, spilling over into the nineties for all the way from the seventies or, or from the, the DIY aspect of the, that was introduced in the eighties. But there was this element of like, oh, well, fuck the corporate marriage of my art and, you know, whatever. And your big machine. And, but it never stopped me from signing a record deal for two decades after. And and not, not a single one <laughs> of them went great, you know. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, like, in... You know, because there was not a lot during the eighties, the like even the first half of the eighties or whatnot. There was not a lot of, you know, our kind of bands that were getting any sort of national right. attention. Um, and you know, remember the the Young Fresh Fellows' first album came out in nineteen eighty three, I suppose, and you know they put out their record on their they made a record label with their friend and and put out their record and started touring and i was like whoa you guys are going on tour yeah yeah records getting played at you know record radio stations across the country and it's like well i think so is ours i mean you know we put in the early 80s we had put out our own records and send them to radio stations and you get they'd send you your playlist back with your record on you know number 17 and we'd go wow well, that's kind of cool never you know never really occur, occurring to us to you know, abs actually get in a van and then go tour the country. We would go down to, you know, go down the right. West Coast for sure. Uh, but, and, and go up to Vancouver. We played in Vancouver, BC all the time. Um, but, you know, there was, there was, you know, it, 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 it seemed like there was a grand divide between DIY and major label things. And, oh, in order to go on a, you know, whole U.S. tour, you had to be on a major label, unless you were like Husker Du or someone like that, who you know relentlessly toured, and they just did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. I mean, Husker Du probably played here, you know, every three or four months for, you know, several years. And and sort of set the pace for that kind of of band. It's like, well, you know... God, we would probably self-destruct if we did that. And of course we would have. And, um, but then, you know, then bands started to do that. It's just like, well, we'll go do something. You know, people do get bored of playing the same places to the same people for over and over and over again. And, you know, then the, then some of the bands in the mid eighties started doing that. And you had your green river who, you know, yeah. made some efforts to get out there and your, you men and, and things like that, that, you know, started kicking down the doors of playing, you know, Northwest style music outside of the Northwest. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, that it was, it's, it's hard. It's, you know, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough thing to do until, you know, then the, then the, uh, the, the grunge scene, undertow starts swelling and it's like oh oh we so we can do that too you know all our all our other friends are you know getting in vans and driving around the country and and playing that i guess that's the 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 public was embracing music enough to go to see and of course of course they did i mean you see how many bands played here touring bands played in 1986 versus how many touring bands played here in 1991 right you know it was you know, it was it was definitely the more than just the seeds 
of a, a grunge revolution. <laughs> it was, you know, it, it got to be it got to be pretty big even by you know before, before then there was clubs everywhere and all these clubs had three bands a night every night of the week and bands were you know this is even before before uh you know the the grunge explosion it was it was it was going um and uh it's like oh sub pop you'll lend us a van wow we'll do that we'll go we'll go to if we can borrow your van and uh you know so everything everything just started going but it never occurred to us that <clears throat> it didn't it never occur to us but it, it it didn't seem to matter that we were not a grunge band. We were from Seattle and we were on Sub Pop and hopefully people that went to go see us found some merits in our music, whatever they may have been. You know, it may have been a different thrill than, than uh, you know, Mud Honey or Tad or, or you know, the, the more more uh, grunge associated bands of the, of the era. I think it's um, a shame that Tad and, doesn't know, get mentioned more in the grunge conversation because they're Titans. Well, the, and is is there a more grunge you know is there more a more prototypical grunge outfit than no. the tad band no and you know you're right they they don't get enough attention and did tad doyle not sort of you know, like you can watch the hype movie and, you know, you can see the people in flannel shirts and, and, you know, blah, 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 all that, those things. But, you know, Tad Doyle was the one who, you know, played it up. Yeah. You know, he gave, you know, he, he played that part and, you know, we did, did he know that he was, uh, you know, a godfather of grunge at the time? You know, maybe not. But, you know, he thought it was funny and, you know, people look at those things and they, they, it's to to me, Tad Doyle is a genius and he's so funny. I mean, it's just like nonstop, you know, it's just nonstop. He and Kurt Danielson, it's just like a, it's, it's like, like nobody else. And if you don't, you know, there's there's got to be lots of lots of kids that were buying those records that maybe didn't quite understand how how funny it was and how much, you know, how those guys just come up with this stuff. They're it's riffing like comedians. They just like bounce ideas off one another and 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 come up with this this stuff that is just priceless. And uh, and it comes out as being these you know larger than life, insane chainsaw wielding. <laughs> <laughs> Northwestern, you know, flannel shirt wearing, um, you know, crazy people, and you know, to to me, it's it's genius. It it was it was so good. Um, and you know, and you know, not not of course, there's a lot of people will not get their their due, and you know, people are always like, God did it. Did it make you, it must have made you angry to see all your friends' bands get, you know, signed to major labels and you guys never did. It's like, well, we weren't thinking about it at the time because we were doing everything, you know, we wanted yeah, to do. Of course. You know, we go make a record whenever we wanted. We, it could be whatever record we wanted to make. Never once did Sub Pop say, you know, you, you, you should, uh, you know, get rid of these kind of songs and do more of this kind of songs. And, and you know, there's never anything like that. The, the record we gave them was the record that they put out. At one point, they did, I believe, say, "Here, what if we gave you a little more studio time and you, you know, worked a little harder <laughs> and and spent a little more time instead of you know making a record in two days and uh, and that?" It's like, oh, well, that was that's a pretty good idea. Yeah, let's do that. And you know, so we I, I even remember this, and and so we had like you know week and a half or two weeks in a studio to make a record, and we're like. Okay, well now what what, what are we going to do? Oh, well we might as well just record 40 songs instead of, <laughs> you know, 15. <laughs> and, and I maybe at the end of that there might have been the the theory of like, okay, well that's great. What if you were to, you know, just work a little bit harder, make sure everything's in time and and make, you know, work a, and I was like, "Oh, we'll take that challenge. We'll we'll give the drummer click track. We'll uh, you know, 
make sure that all the the bass lines up, you know, you know, like we'll 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 work a little harder on the rhythm tracks and stuff like that, and and that was fine. Boring. You know, that, but that was. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was i'm sure that was absolutely the only direction we ever got from the record label so you know the fact that we were not popular definitely we could not we could not blame that on anyone at sub pop or anyone else really um you know and really we were never we were never courted by any major is that label. right even though we had tons of friends that worked at major labels never once and like oh yeah, never once when we could have you know had our hands up you know for I don't know what labels people you know some of the labels that people were talent scouts at or you know actually worked at or you know anything it's like what about us over here you know uh, we like to go out for dinner and um, you know we we go for Thai food or or Italian or or no okay <laughs> well we'll just uh, you know do our thing oh yeah well that last record you know what about us we 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 you know me we me we can do something bigger no no hands waving what about it? no you know. It just, it just wasn't, it right. just didn't happen. Um, and, you know, we didn't let it, we didn't, not like it got to us or well, anything. It sure we didn't still, stop you. You know, still did what we wanted. I mean, no, that's, it, uh, <laughs> that's the thing it is, uh, stop us. who's way, the very nature of, of what everyone should be doing is like, don't wait around for permission. Like, don't wait, don't right, wait around right, don't, for your yeah. golden Wonka ticket. Right, right. Your 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 uh, your Wonka yeah. bar ticket. You know, just just try to do it, and 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 somehow that group of people had some initiative. Even though you know, I look back and it's like, how how did we how do we do that stuff? You know, like, where did the initiative? It's like, and you know, the tours. We went every once in a while. We would get to have somebody on our tour to help us. And the longer we went and the better shows we got, it's like, oh, oh, we made enough money. We can bring somebody to go on tour with us. Like, great. Wow. We actually have somebody to go on tour with us to help. <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. Um, it, But also so, so weird, you know, like, uh, you know, just, just thinking of, uh, you know, that group of people, it seems like, it seems like we wouldn't have been able to accomplish anything, let alone make a bunch of records that still seem pretty good yeah. and, and, you know, go play a bunch of shows around the world. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, you, and you guys, did you guys not tour with Pearl Jam also? We did. Uh, I believe we opened all the Pearl Jam shows in 1996. Turns out big tour. Yeah. 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 We, we did, um, Gosh, we did uh, the uh, the U.S. dates, which was I think about a month, and uh, and 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 came back and we're like, wow, that sure was fun. And then you know, like a, a week or so later, we get a call. It's like, oh yeah, well we got a Europe tour too. Do you guys want to do that? <laughs> another you know another month long tour through, and we're like. Oh really? Wow. Um, let me ask everyone else and see what they think. Yes. Right. <laughs> and um, you know, that was that was you know, it, what more what more, you know, could you want? And also 1996, we uh we did a tour with the presidents of the United States and of America we were on top of the world through Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it was you know, there was there was so many things. It's like so many fun things to do that really we didn't stop and you know think about our career moves and uh and where we were going and what was happening until later until probably 1997 and we you know our records had come out around the world and you know we thought we were doing doing pretty good and you know time to think about making a new record and uh you know by 1970 or 1970 1997 or 1998 you know, it was it was clear that you know something had happened at Sub Pop, and they were not necessarily very supportive of us. And I was like, "Well, you know, we want to do this and we want to do that," and and they're like, "You know, no, we're not." It, it, and we were self self propelling at that by that right. point, but they were like, "Yeah, 
no, we want you to do this and want you to do that. It's like, well, aren't you proud that we went on, you know, two and a half months of Pearl Jam shows? And they're like, say, no, we don't really care about that. It's like, well, oh, okay. And uh, and then uh, like we thought you'd you sell. Know, uh, I think we had a twenty, you know, two hundred thousand records on that tour. Right, right, and and of course, of course, we you know we thought we were on top of the world, but at the same time, if you go play these shows, then only the Pearl Jam people are going to see you, and you know, if one in ten of those people likes you enough to buy a record, that's pretty good. Um, but uh, they're like, and and in hindsight, it all makes sense. It's like, well, we want you to go on your own tour, and uh, you know, play some clubs and stuff. It's like. You know, we might have thought at that point that we were pretty hot. It's like, well, we just, you know, toured the world playing these, uh, you know, 20,000 to 80,000 seat. Uh, right. What do know, we want to go play the grog shop for? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> it's like, and of course we did go play Great the grog place. shop shop and there i some there was just a couple of years ago somebody sent a, a tape of the show that we did at the grog shop it must have been you know 99 or something like that and i was like holy oh, crap awesome. it's just like it, it was it, the the you know and I, you know you don't know you don't really you don't really the little hindsight you can sort of see how uh, things happened as how they did um and it must have been 99 because lula was not on the tour she was having a having a kid and um or maybe it was 2000 even um, the, the grog shop tape. <laughs> and, and it's just like on fire. It's just like, you know, insanity. It's like listening to those 1983 Van Halen shows, you know, in its own way. It's not, it's not like listening to Van Halen. Don't get me wrong, but it's like, you know, a, a, a small little club, and somebody with a cassette recorder and however many people were there, there it wasn't, it was, it was, you know, whatever it was, but it was on fire. It was, it was like, wow. Okay. I can see this. This is pretty killer. And, um, you know, he fumbled around for a while, put a record out on a different label and, uh, and then Kim quit. Right. <laughs> well, that was, yeah. Right. What, what was that? 2002. I think it was 2002. Yeah, yeah. We had uh, we had, you know, put out uh, our last record uh, uh um The Day That Didn't Exist and did a did a a, a fun tour. It must have been it must have been the Grog Shop. That must have been the first night of that tour. I believe we flew from South by Southwest to is it where's the Grog Shop? It's, it's Ohio, uh, right? S- Cleveland. Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, and, and we flew there and, you know, we didn't, as I said, we're kind of, kind of a, a bunch of boneheads. It's like, well, we're not going to drive a van to South by Southwest, stay there for that festival and then drive all the way to Cleveland. It's like, well, can we rent a van in Cleveland? Can we bring a few pieces of gear? And we thought, well, we could bring some gear. We could rent some gear. No, that just costs so much. Why don't we just go to Cleveland a few days early and buy a bunch of gear? <laughs> Is that what you did? <laughs> and so we did. Yeah. So we went to Cleveland. And, and, you know, I was on the phone with some guitar shops and stuff like that. I knew there was, you know, at least a few things to at least start with. And we went and bought a bass amp, bass cabinet. I think I brought my guitar head and Mike rounded up a drum set. I bought, I bought a Marshall cabinet and uh, rented a van there. And, uh, you know, just boneheaded around <laughs> you know, the, the, the Midwest East coast for a few weeks. And, and that was our tour. And, you know, I just remember, I just remember being like, oh my God, these people are crazy. And, you know, cause people in that band were starting to lose it a little bit. I'm, I, I won't, uh, I won't, I won't sugarcoat it. There was, there was some losing it going right. on. And, um, and I was just like, wow, this is, this is crazy. I'm kind of you know, white knuckling some of these drives. Um, but clearly some of the shows were blazing and, and uh, I, you know, I remember some of those shows pretty well and, you know, get home and the record labels happy. You know, we're talking to everybody, everybody's, everybody's charged up the record label after our tour gave us some tour support. It's like, Oh, we didn't know you, you were that kind of a band here. Here's some, some money that that's great. We, this is wonderful. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, we get back to start practicing. It's like, okay, 
that was that was pretty fun. We did something and and came back to practice. Like, okay, well, I have a few new songs. Uh, let's, let's think about you know working on some new new music for a new record. And that was right. not to be. It was it was Splitsville, and uh, I was like, huh. Well, that's interesting. And then in hindsight, there was many, many, you know, little red flags that came up along sure. the way that would have, would have let me know that, you know, there maybe there's some things that were just a little bit screwball going on. I mean, that just, that it might not have been kept up its momentum. But that band Whatever. started in, did it start in the seventies? Yeah. The Fastbacks? Well, I can tell you, I have it. I have the cassette tape of our first show right really? here. N- not not because I pulled it out, but just because it happens to be sitting on this same counter in the studio downstairs. February sixteenth, nineteen eighty, was our first show. So it's and it's at least fathomable to it's at least worth considering that you were formed and rehearsed in nineteen seventy nine and. November, December, you were practicing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, absolutely. We would have we would have uh, formed in 1979. So technically, a 70s band. I, you know, if, if there's any <laughs> decade assignable to the fastbacks as a, uh, as a stanchion, as a, a signpost or a mile marker, if there was a decade, it, w- it would firmly 20? be the seventies. Even though you know we didn't start playing till the eighties. Twenty-two 80s, but years is a good we were, ass run. That I, I, you know, I don't. I, uh, it would be. It, I, I still love all those songs, and I still love all those people, and we still yeah. get together. We hang out. We, you know, just don't actually be a band anymore. But I would, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I mean, there's there's people in bands that were way more like incredibly successful and, and they can't right. stand each other and they would n- under no circumstances would even be in the same room as each other like Van and Halen. there's bands that hate <laughs> their recorded output and they hate everything it's like i wouldn't trade that experience for anything i mean i i really you know I, it's not like i will just go put on fastbacks records all the time just to listen to it, but they're they're you know i hear enough of the, that music just from being around you know, just being around and I'm always happy. I, 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 I'm proud of everything we did. I'm glad we did everything and I'm glad that we're still friends. I'm glad that we're all still alive and I'm glad that, you know, that everything is the way it is. And at the time, you know, you just, you, you just keep wanting more and more and more and you, you know, you do these Pearl Jam shows and you just maybe, you know, you might, I don't know if we ever really totally copped attitudes or anything like that. Cause you know, Clearly, we played the grog shop, and and we were having the time of our lives. I can, but you I at least tell. In, in those um, moments you suspend the idea of it ever ending. You you at least consider that right, this right. is and, just and, your life, and, and your life will continue on as such. Right, you just assume that everything will keep getting better, and you know, and 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 I'm not saying it. it, it I'm not saying it didn't keep getting better, but it didn't, <laughs> it didn't keep getting well, grander it didn't than that. It didn't quite continue. It 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 had its uh, it had its its fights and its moments and 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 didn't continue. But you know, I, I, I in hindsight, there's many things that I might do differently, but not necessarily. You know, am I sad of the way things did happen? Uh, so you and I it, it would be of z- probably zero. Uh, zero memory to you, but we met in either 97 or maybe 98. I don't remember when the first bachelor's record came out, but uh, Johnny Sangster was producing it, recording it and producing it with us. We had uh, two days at egg to record it and mix it, which is, which was, (laughs) yeah. I, you know, it was my first time. Well, I know I had recorded in like a, an ADAT studio and it was, but it was much the same, you know, like the band just played the songs live and, and then the vocals were overdubbed, but there was even a couple that, you know, I, I think there were one, uh, there was at least one completely live song, no punches and maybe two. 
and very minimal overdubs. But mm -hmm. I don't remember what we needed. Like I had a I had an okay guitar. I borrowed I borrowed a hollow body from Grant Johnson. And I borrowed mm -hmm. a uh I borrowed Steve Max 63 AC30. 60 Whoa. That oh, sounds yeah, rad. dude. He was just like, here you go. Take this and turn it all the way up. Everything, just dime it. And that's how it sounds good. And I was like, that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. And then we get it there and we put it in that little amp room that, you know, that was down mm -hmm. in the basement there at Egg. And um, and uh, Johnny walks in. He goes, um, let me look at your, let me look at your amp settings. And he goes... Oh, no, 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 you got it all wrong. And he just took his hand and, you know, turned everything up to 10. He's like, <laughs> the only, you know, that's that's it right there. It's perfect. And sure as shit, that was, that was it. But we needed, so we borrowed something from you. I don't remember what it was. Did maybe um, a Farfisa? Mm. I did. Uh, yeah, I do have a Farfisa uh, mini compact. We borrowed compact. that from you. It's crazy because, it, and it was and the it, day, it, the first day of tracking. And and Johnny said, you know what, that you know that one song, because we had like our four track demos, he goes, I think that a Farfisa would sound really good on on this. And I was like, well, I don't even know what that is. And uh you know, maybe Dusty knew what it was. I don't even know. But we were like, Well, we we can't buy one of those. And he said, Don't you worry about a thing, because <laughs> <laughs> my, my, <laughs> my he said my Have friend I Kurt has one of everything for you <laughs> and uh let me call him and so he it was early in the morning i think he even woke you up like you know because it was like we were getting ready <laughs> meeting up before starting at 11 or whatever like we we probably were at your house at 9 a.m which is pretty early right <laughs> wow yeah, that's pretty early, especially in 1998. Right. No, I think you answered you know, the door in your bathrobe, little... and you were like, here you go. Uh... <laughs> it's probably pretty late riser at that uh, point. Let me I have imagine. it back whenever you're done. Um, yeah, or just leave it at egg, because I know I'll be week. there, you know, within the next <laughs> week or so. Uh, but clearly, in 1998, you had already amassed a bunch of gear. Like, so through this whole time, like you said, for example, you, you guys flew into Cleveland. You're like, eh, we'll just buy a backline. Did, did. <laughs> you will just buy a backline and then sell it when we, whenever our last show was New York or something like that. And, you know, because, I mean, but you can did rent you stuff. sell it or did you inevitably just say, no, I'm going to keep this? Uh, well, we couldn't have kept, kept it because we were flying back from wherever our last show is, I believe. Um. Oh, of course, but we had to return the van. I, you know, I, the logistics, I'm not quite sure, but we know we couldn't have brought right. the gear back. Um, and so we left it at one of the guys that worked at our record label at the time. Um, we're just like, because our theory was to sell it. And then, you know, you just, after you're done, it's like we're talking about gear and everybody's having a fun time and drinking beers and laughing. It's like, oh, why don't you just keep all this stuff? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> you know, like... I mean, because, you know, it wasn't expensive gear. It was, you know, every every each piece was, you know, two or three hundred dollars at the time. And it's like, whatever, a few hundred bucks worth of gear. Right. That's cool. Whatever. Uh, the, <laughs> and, and, and it was and it was, you know, none of the gear was anything that was special to right. me. Like, you know, it, there was not it was not like a stripey front Marshall cabinet or, a, you know, a, you know, nothing was everything was functionally fine, but it was nothing that was, you know, cool and special or anything like that. And we thought, oh, well, we'll and then again, we thought, oh, of course, we'll be out here again. Um, so if we give it, if we give it to him, we, you know, he'll still have it and we can just go grab it again next time we need some gear. Little to know there wasn't going to so be. So it's a still next there, time. so I could maybe go pick it up. 
Yeah, yeah, that was it was that would have been two thousand one probably. probably. Sure. So I'm sure it's still it wasn't there. That long it's ago. It's not quite twenty. I think after twenty years, you have to make a you have to make a stand on it, whether you're going to take it or not. But <laughs> under twenty years, no problem. Uh, is so, it yeah, true? Yeah. Is it true that you you have one of Kurt Cobain's smashed guitars and you glued it back together? Yes. That was was that uh, that was such a pause. Did did you uh, were you hesitant to mention? Well, you know, I, I'm not I'm not even sure what to think about it. Um, because it was a guitar that was it was it was thrown in the garbage <laughs> at a Capitol Hill practice place. I mean, it was it was That's in the garbage. <laughs> what was that by the place puss puss. called there was the maybe that was it it was a place i'd never been before um i, I don't know if, if uh whole practice there and in the, it, um it was by the bmw dealership on capitol hill was yeah that puss puss puss? Puss was that cafe on pine right at the end of the block squid row was right there yeah, yeah, it was right, right around there, and the 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 car yeah. lot and all that crap. And I think you know whatever we were doing there. I mean, of course, we were practicing music. But <laughs> why I don't know. And uh, <clears throat> and there's a, a Univox, uh, you know, high flyer, Moserite ish copy crammed in the crammed in the garbage. It was like, cool. What's that? I was like, why is that there? It's like, oh, uh, Nirvana were practicing here, and, and and Kurt got shocked off the mic, and and you know, chucked the guitar, and it busted. Like, oh, oh, all right. Um, and so like we practiced and stuff, and I was like, yeah, oh, throw a guitar in the garbage, and I mean, it was it was pretty well wrecked. The the back of the neck was broken out, and the 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 truss rod was you know, protruding out the back of the neck. I mean, it, you know, if he got shocked, you know, probably he took it and threw it neck first into the wall or something like that. But, you know, a bunch of, there was some scattered pickup pieces that were on the floor. And I, I think there was a plastic bag there. So I just chucked everything in a bag. and So it was in 20 pieces. And thought, oh. It was, it was, well, maybe not 20, but a few. I mean, the headstock was fully off. The, the truss rod was poking out the back. And for some reason, there was pieces of like the magnets from the guitar pickup were strewn all about. Um, so I just put it in a in a in a plastic garbage bag, and I was driving the Chev Nova at the time. Uh, hatchback, classic. classic was great, great, uh, great car. Plenty, plenty of plenty of room to carry stuff, but also plenty of room under the uh, under the seat. So I, I I just crammed it under the either the driver's seat or the passenger seat. And, you know, drive on, it was like, you know, it, it looked like it was useless. We really did. It was just, you know, but I can't walk away from a guitar. It's like, I'm not. It's not in your nature. You know, throw that in the garbage. It's in your nature. Yeah, it's not in my nature to to leave a broken guitar behind. So, and it, it was it was under the seat of the guitar for years. I mean, not just like a few months or anything like that, for a long time. And, you know, selling the guitar, selling the car finally, it's like, I got to get a new car. This is you know, I'd probably changed the radiator a couple of times, but probably not changed enough other stuff to make it so the radiator <laughs> wasn't going to go out again. It's like, I don't know. I'm not a car guy, but, you know, you just just start changing stuff, thinking you're going to solve all the problems right. in the car. It's like, no. Um, I was like, I better get everything out. So, oh, there's a guitar there. So, you know, put it in the house somewhere and still didn't even think about it, you know, for the longest time. And... um <clears throat> Then at some point, um, I believe, oh, I can't, I can't remember. I think it was, I think it was back together, you know, by the early 2000s, I had just glued it back together. It's like, well, I might as well see if I can make this work. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't do a, a, a pretty job of gluing it back together, which, you know, would that have been important? I don't know. Um, but got it so it would work and play. And I didn't change any of the parts. There's one of the pickups doesn't work very good because there's some some of the magnets are still out. But I, I think I had enough magnets to fill in the magnets <laughs> of the the bridge pickup. Um, so I did that, 
and glued it together and, you know, maybe made it so there was not any chunks of wood sticking out the back of the neck, but the neck is straight and got it so it would adjust and got it so it would work. And then it would have been whatever year the EMP did the uh, anniversary of Nevermind, you know, if that whatever it was, was it 2007? Was it? Oh, that was, Ooh, oh, I remember that because was. I there was a big show and I played. We all played. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. What year was it? It must have been 2000, maybe 25 year anniversary. 12? Of never, what's that, 11? 11? Well, 2012 would have been, yeah, 12 would have been the 30th yeah. anniversary, right? So that no, would have be sense. 20. That, that, that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. My math is, is perfect. <laughs> See, I'm, it, I'm, all it all comes back, back to the math, and I'm, I'm a kind of a, yeah, kind of whiz with that stuff. So then I start thinking, it's like, oh, Nirvana anniversary. And, you know, in 2012, the Fastbacks hadn't played a show for 10 years. Um, and, and they asked, it's like, would you guys want to be part of this? And I was like, yeah, if we can play Smells Like Teen Spirit, then uh, yes. Uh, uh. And, and I was like, cause you know, what, what's, I mean, there's, I love that album. I'd, I'd play, be happily play any song on that record. Um, but I thought, you know, might as well just throw that out there and they go, oh yeah, nobody's signed up for that song yet. It's like, oh yeah. Well, let me, let me get this guitar going so I, so I can play it on the, uh, on the, the trash Kurt and Cobain you guitar. did. And I did. And it was, and it was great. Holy shit. And I, but I didn't I didn't go and say, I'm okay. Uh, right. This this guitar because it was the first song. You know, we just wanted to come out and go high and launch right into it. You know, because that's what you'd have to do if you're playing that song. You don't want to, you know, hear some uh, dork talking right. for five minutes before they play this. I was like, shut up, dude. Um, so uh, so you know, just went out there and, and we did it. And and it, I thought I thought we did a great version. I thought it was it was really good and it was super fun and of course super exciting. And um and that was that was that. I didn't I didn't say this is Kurt Cobain's old guitar. Um when that was kind of the last time I'd really thought right. about it. And then you just put it in a bag and stuffed it up into your attic. Well, no, I didn't put it in a bag. Um no, I didn't, didn't put it in a bag, but I don't of course I didn't have the case for it, so uh but it it, it is uh it is oscillating around yeah. the universe still. Crazy. <laughs> what a and it has had it has had Teen Spirit played on it at least <laughs> once, if not by Kurt, by another Kurt. Yeah, you could say Kurt played Teen Spirit on this at least once. I guarantee you Guarantee. You say which guarantee i couldn't guarantee which kurt it was well i could guarantee which kurt <laughs> it, it was you. because you know i wasn't at the uh the rehearsal where he right. smashed it uh what uh what do you what are you doing with your with your free time do you have free time is it free time for kurt right now <clears throat> Not exact. I mean, you know, it it could be, but all the stuff I like to do is kind of stuff that is right. kind of work. <clears throat> you know, working on you know building and fixing guitars, and if it, it, I, I set up a drum set in the basement, thinking that I could start working on some more music of my own. Um. And that was about a month ago, and I still haven't got the microphones on the drum set to start recording. How much stuff. of an entailed studio? Um, so I guess I guess I'm busy enough doing work things. How much of a of What's an that? entailed? How entailed is your studio in your basement? Well, I'd like to say that I don't have a studio in the basement, um, just because because I don't really. But uh, you know, there's a, there's some recording gear and some instruments and stuff like that. So. You know, I, I it's it's basically like a junk playroom down here. Full Home of is where the records heart is, and amps and drums and stuff like that. Uh, but there is, you know, a, a, a recording a recording option down here, and um, so you know things things can happen here. It's 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 not a studio in that you know people could 
actually come here and do anything. Uh, just, you know, for the reason that anyone's, uh, you know, cluttered basement might not be, you know, uh, uh, an easily. And I, I, I've never wanted to have a commercial studio um, at my house or anywhere else just because there's so much, there's so much heaviness to. Right. I, I I guess I love to record music, but I only really like to record music that I like. <laughs> uh, I often forget, and I'll mention and, it now, you're a Grammy-nominated producer. <laughs> I suppose I suppose that's true. <laughs> you're a Grammy-nominated if, producer, if you, you know, you, Locke. If you, if, you, if you were to stretch a tiny bit of the truth, that could be true. But I'm, I'm not going to argue Isn't with that. Isn't that absolutely true? What's untrue about that? Well, <clears throat> well, I, I, uh, I recorded a Grammy-nominated record. Now, you know, does that... Uh, a, a record that I produced was nominated for a Grammy. I, I, to get technical, if I was a Grammy-nominated producer, I would have been nominated as a producer. Right. Uh, but none of it matters at all because it, it, it was, it's all very funny and, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm happy. Going to the Grammys was a great experience. It was What real, did you wear? I wore tux, dude. Um, nice. Uh, and uh, and got, f- no, if I did wear a tux and I keep thinking I got fitted for it up here and they'd send the measurements down and then you'd pick it up and, and whatnot. No, I, I, I got the tux up here because... I never changed out of the tux. Uh, we stayed out all night. You Grammy wore it parties. on the plane? Gra- yes, I did. Grammy parties and um, and and stayed out all night and got no sleep and was just crashed out at the gate of the airplane the next morning. <laughs> uh, and <clears throat> and I, I had I own a uh, a little little fender champ uh, uh whatever whatever year they went to a black tolex on it rather than the tweed one in the early 60s i suppose yeah and and i'd lent it to my little brother i bought it at a music store for 50 bucks in you know 1979 or something like that and my brother wanted an amp and he lived in la so it's oh you can borrow this you borrow this and so i was i was i was it was was down there it was whatever year it was 99 2000 something like that and uh and so I wanted to get the amp back. So, and I stayed at my brother's house. So I grabbed the amp, go to the airport. So I'm sitting at the gate with my hands wrapped around the, the handle of the amp in a, in a tux and just as toxic as can be at that point. And, uh, I just, I'd fallen asleep at the, in one of the, you know, the, one of the bench <laughs> chairs at the, at the gate, I get a tap on the shoulder. It's like, Oh no, hopefully I'm not getting kicked out for falling asleep at the airport or something. And it's, it, it's this gal. And she's like, you know, you look like you could really use a hand right now. I'm going to, I, I, we have a room in first class. I'm going to, I'm going to bump you up to first class. And I looked at her, I was like, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, almost tears in my eyes. And I thought, gosh, if, if, if in any other situation you'd think, oh, yeah, I can go to first class and like just drink, you know, free drinks and blah, 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 blah. No, you just wanted the room to sleep. I just wanted the room to sleep. And I, you know, just probably guzzled as much water as I could and conked out and got back. And, you know, everything's back to normal. But, but Grammys were great. Some great. And that's parties. exactly why you wear a tux every time you fly now, right? <laughs> yeah, that's. And if I was going to go to the Grammys again, I would wear that tux again. Fortunately, I didn't wreck it and have to pay pay extra for getting it fixed up. So I must have, you know, must have right around in the limo through L.A. You know, in the in the in a in a tux. You know, that's that's the way to do it. That's the way you make sure that you're not going to get it ripped up or you know. Uh, uh, damaged in any way, you know, just make sure you're in a limo when you're riding around in your tux and, and you of won't course. have to pay for the thing. You know. A nice limo. I'm sure there are shitty limos out there with springs coming out of the seats. Oh yeah. Not this one. This one had, you know, it had vodka, whiskey Kush. and, uh, and gin in the decanters in the back, you know, the big back of the limo and stuff. And it's like ready you know, to roll. Right. Right. Cause you can't drink at the Grammys. You know, they, they Is don't, that right? they, they don't let you, you're not drinking there or eating or anything. I mean, you're there for a long time, 
you know, you have to, you have to, you know, raise your, you have to, you have to signal somebody if you need to go to the bathroom and they will send somebody to sit in your place while you're going to the bathroom, you know, so, so, you know, they're just, there's the no drinking, no eating, no nothing. It's like, wow, that's kind of crazy. So after you're done with that and you get into your limo to go to the parties, you're just like, dude, we can drink as much as we want in the limo. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we, I think we got our money's worth on that trip. It sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, and and I still have the amp too, the little Fender Champ. Still up. I on wish the wall. I still had my little Champ. I didn't. Mine wasn't nearly as. I had a little Vibro Champ, the little silver face one. Yeah, it was, sounded great. Yeah, those are great. Yeah, uh, I don't know why I got rid of it. Yeah, you know, you just you, you, most people have this idea that they can't keep everything. <laughs> <laughs> Fools, <laughs> fools. Yeah, yeah. That's that's, that's a misnomer. <laughs> uh, Kurt, it's it's nine thirty here, and I need to walk my dogs, edit this podcast, post it, and get to sleep because I got to drive to New York City tomorrow. Oh yeah, what do you got going on in in the in the Big Apple? Well, I'm gonna stay the night in our apartment down there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Thursday, uh, Monday, I'm gonna spend the day well i'm gonna spend the morning driving there and then i'll spend the day driving around making sales calls and then stay the night tuesday i'll do the same thing and follow up on some stuff that i sales opportunities Mm -hmm. that i have in the city and then i'll drive back up here tuesday night fantastic right yeah that's quite um, good. I feel I, like I could talk to you. I feel like I could uh, like talk to you, ask you questions, and hear you tell stories for five hours, <laughs> and be uh, fully entertained the entire time. Yeah, there's 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 lots of <laughs> there's lots of good stuff, and we didn't even talk any of the bad stories of like doing horrible <laughs> things. And <laughs> well, you know who wants to hear that? Yeah, nobody <laughs> wants to hear those things. <laughs> uh Here's a last little bit. You've seen the videos, Couch Riff's videos. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's something for you to consider. Mm-hmm. This is something to put in your pipe. I am making videos now. I'll I'll be releasing my first one this week. Um, and I have a I have a maybe a half dozen in various states of completion. Um with where they're uh, everyone is doing their part and and filming themselves excuse me in you know isolation so it's just like tracking a record essentially right sure sure uh in the modern day at least not a cool record it's not how they did live at rock and the Fillmore. <laughs> no, but... that's not how they did <laughs> performance rock and uh, the but, Fillmore. uh i'd love it if you would guest in an episode, it would entail, I'll send you the track. Maybe it's just the basic. Maybe there's a rhythm guitar and drums and bass. Uh, and and have you rip some rip on it and track your part and, and film yourself and send it back. Then I throw it all together and uh, boom, Bob's your uncle. And then, do you, then what you have there is art. That's right. I we do will, have art. We will make art. I do love art. Kurt, let me tell you something. What we have here is art. This is what we call this, art. And I love <laughs> art. Uh, absolutely. Excellent. I have quite quite a sturdy song list, mm-hmm. including some yes songs. Mm. Dude, I have Starship Troopers on there, which is probably... Am- more ambitious than I need to be. Starship Trooper is pretty hard. I have played it in its entirety. I know. <laughs> um, that's a jam, man. And I have, it's, um, it's wicked. <laughs> let's see. I have a couple. What do I have? Starship Trooper and Long Distance Runaround. Those are the two yes songs I have. Wait, on lo- there. Long Distance Runaround is a, is a little bit easier to do, but uh, in fact, could do Starship Trooper. And I mean, there's three parts to it. Um. Oh right. You know, and I, I, I could imagine, I at one point I did learn the loneliness is the power that we possess. That part, the the finger-picking part, is 
Well, man, that, that that is amongst the hardest parts. <laughs> I also really, you know, what song is uh, not on here that I really like is "Sweetness." Oh, absolutely. Oh, that song is dynamite. I, you know, those first two Yes records, I think, are just wonderful. I really like both those records a lot. Um, um and that they're lesser known for sure. There are a lot of. I know that you're a Yes fan, so I, uh, that's why I mentioned those. There are 300 songs in this list. <laughs> so they're all over the board, you see. And the, it, like, just thinking, if you did Starship Trooper, you could assign different people to the three, the three parts movements. of it. Oh, that would be epic. Yeah, that would be epic. And then if, you know, like, of course, I love to shred some lead, but... Um, if you like at the end the worm part, you know, if you want the part to, that sounds like Nirvana. Does it, uh, dude? The chord progression is uh, what is the um, oh uh, 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 heart shaped box? No, 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 it's um, it's something off of off. Never mind. It's um, blah da 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 blah da 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 right. I, is that I, it? Yeah, yeah, that's that. That's the. Well, I mean, I think of the the, the worm from from Starship Trooper is is those yeah. chords, but I, you know, yeah. of course, I don't think of those being. Nah, 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 right, of course. Nah, 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 I don't know. I'm nah, thinking nah, of the Nirvana nah, nah, nah. version of it, but the chord the chord progression is so similar. Huh, I'd have never picked it out, but my wife has this mind. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, she has like a. Uh, relative pitch for riffs or something you know right right and in spots this sounds like such and such and i'll be like what oh yeah listen to it and some you know two crazy songs and then we'll put right right and and, and, oh holy shit you know i I may or may not find those figure those things out but you know once somebody points them out and and if it is the same chords then it is the same chords and and you know kurt cobain he could have had the yes album i mean how many chords are there to (laughs) do you know it's right like, right and, and you can use you can use the same some... three or you can throw a throw an oddball one in there and and tell me that nirvana wasn't you know the kings of taking a, a weird ugly chord progression and making a, a wonderful song out of it i mean that right it's like well, i mean that wouldn't be the chord progression that i pointed my finger at i'd point my finger at come as you are and say, hey, you have you guys heard Killing Joke? <laughs> or uh, uh, Life Goes On by The Damned? I mean... Because I, I knew mean, The Damned song, you know... I, I didn't actually know the Killing Joke song when that came out. What is it called? The 80s? Is that what it's 80s, called? 80s, yeah, yeah, the 80s by yeah. Killing Joke. And... Uh, yeah. So but, good, and but so like even the tone, even you're like, right, right. And the, had the, the cor- chorus, I was the clean with the chorus. Thing. It was like, oh my god! And you know, let's face it. I mean, it, it's a it's a cool that that the the riff of eight the eighties and uh, and come as you are. You know, it is it is the same riff and it is the same sound. And you know, I, I'm almost as surprised that that doesn't happen more. I mean, there's so many songs, and and you know, like. Even if you heard that Killing Joke song once five years ago or ten years ago or, you know, long time, any amount of time before, that, you know, like I always think if I come up with a song and it, and it sounds cool and it's fun, it's like, this is killer. You know, what if it's exactly the same as some other song? And fortunately, we were never in a, in a we we're never popular enough that anybody, that we, we never made any money off any records. So that if there, if that was a problem, you know, it wouldn't have been a problem. Right. And, and and you can try, you know, n- nobody's going to sit there and go, I'm going to steal a part of a song that was popular and see if anybody notices. You know, I don't think anybody, nobody's really right. going to do that. I don't um, think any people have that kind of a devious mind. Right, right. Especially, especially not Nirvana. Um And, but I'm just surprised it's not more often because I mean, it's such a perfect riff with that, with that sound. You know, with right. that chorus and the, you know, that, that it's just like, geez. And I don't know when the eighties came out by killing joke. The damned one was, you know, 1982, maybe 81. Right. Um, 
Uh, Wait, I yeah. don't know that. What is the damned song? Life goes on, and it sounds just like that. Yeah, it's it's you know very close to the same, if not exactly the same, the same um, little chromatic the same thing. deal. The, you know that same whatever that thing is. And I guess I guess the Young Fresh Fellows actually did play the damned song at one point. So <laughs> that was my <laughs> first uh, my first you know thoughts of that of that riff and then when when come as you are came out it's like oh that's the same as the damned and then you but you know you, i didn't i don't ever remember the damned ever you know filing suit against nirvana raisin, raisin but i don't know if they made stink. it up or maybe they stole it from killing joke too i don't i don't know i mean I, <laughs> you know if uh, i go at least the first couple killing joke records are are monumental you know pillars yeah. you know that 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 first killing joke record I'd almost go on record as saying it was as much of a foundation shaker as the first Van Halen record, you know, back in its day, whenever it came out, 1980, it, it probably was something like that. Combined and so many crazy things. It, it, it did. I mean, nobody, there was no like punk metal, you know, fist in your face music quasi industrial yeah yeah it was it was just like this mix of every we had never heard anything like that before and 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 you know it just the and just the overall sound of it it was like crikey what is this you know the the kind of records that sound like nothing you've ever heard before and you know, and, and it had keyboards, and by that point, keyboards right. were we were tired of keyboards. You know, it, w- it was it was not it, it was not something you ever thought. It's like not necessarily keyboards were universally uncool, but you wouldn't think usually when people had keyboards in their band, it was uncool at that point. Right. Um, but but in probably their case, probably no Killing Joke, no Ministry, no Nine Inch Nails, no or Big it, Black. Or yeah, yeah. If 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 that and, and you know, of course, you know, all those guys had that record, and yeah. uh, and you know, there's all there's of course there was also Susie and the Banshees around the same time, which you know, no Susie and the Banshees, maybe no uh, Blackouts of the Seattle right band. You know, uh, you know the the band. It was just it was just time for that. But you know, Susie and the Banshees. We had some Susie and the Banshees singles, and 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 when they put out that one record. Uh, Juju, it was like, oh, uh, there was another, another, you know, just this wild game changer. But we, it was a band we'd already heard of when Killing Joke. I mean, they had a couple 45s and we were aware of that. But when that album came out, it was, it was like, you know, everybody had it. It was just one of those things that was like, there, a record that was so universally, you know, effective. It didn't matter if you're a punk rocker or a, you know, a bat caver or whatever, you, you know, everybody liked that record. And because and, and, it, right. it was nothing like what we had before. And that's uh-huh. cool. Uh-huh. That's what I call cool. <laughs> <laughs> now that's what I call cool. Now that's Kurt, what I, I call cool. I gotta, I gotta hit it, buddy. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta fold it up. Well, um, let me uh, stop this uh, machine here and I will send you. I will. Uh, oh, s- send me your email, if, if, your email address, and I'll. I'll uh, we oh, yeah, transfer you the uh, the audio. How long? Uh, how long do you think that takes? I'm going to stop recording now. Say goodbye. Bye. Thank you for having me, <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about rock and roll again sometime. No doubt. No doubt.